Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. We are on part two. We are beginning the part two. We're going to start with uh, Rob, then I'll have a short comment. Then uh, we're going to go to Sherry, Iris, Rupali, and Joya. Keep track of all your questions. Then we'll collect all the questions and try, try to answer all of them, okay? So, uh, do use pen and paper to keep track of all your questions. We'll start off with Rob. Rob, floor, floor is all yours. Okay, so we're doing the first five chapters of part two uh, of, of the Fountainhead. And of course, these first couple chapters are the like, most uh, controversial scene, perhaps, of the novel, which is you know the, the, uh, the quote unquote rape scene with uh, uh, Dominique and uh, Howard Rourke. Um, now, you know, if you read, well, I'm gonna dispense with some of the obvious things, which is that if you read through this, it's of course, it's very clear that it's not, you know, a, a forcible rape as, 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 you know, by any legal definition that she pursues him and she uh, wants him there. And, you know, when there's, it's very clear, it's made, I, it, I've struck me this time reading through how clear it is made that you know she doesn't call out for help. She doesn't do anything that would actually stop him. <laughs> Though she goes through the motions of 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 wanting to resist. Um, so, but this is the scene that sort of also highlights that we've talked before about the team Dominique versus you know the, the those of us for whom Dominique kind of drives us nuts, and those who who like Dominique more. Um, and uh, so I, I like to think of it as team Dominique versus team Dagny. Because you know, mm -hmm. Dagny Taggart is very a very opposite kind of character from Dominique. She's the female lead of Ayn Rand's that I that I like the most, and you know, uh, 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 really captures my imagination. Whereas Dominique's the one I have to like work to understand. Uh, and I think they are kind of opposite characters. I, it, it, something that intrigued me actually, and I, I I put this into my book on Atlas Shrugged that. Um, because I read the fount, I read Atlas Shrugged first and read the Fountainhead second. But I, I, I realized if I had read it the other way around, there's a scene very early on in Atlas Shrugged where uh, you have Dominique and Francisco, sorry, Dagny and Francisco D'Anconia. And she's sort of figuring out, this is very early in the novel, so it's not a spoiler, but she's figuring out that Francisco D'Anconia is deliberately just, you know, engaging in deliberately destructive business deals. Uh, that are meant to fail and meant to bring down uh, uh, other corp other companies and bring down the financial markets along with him. She realizes he's doing this on purpose. He's doing this destructive things on purpose. And it struck me to the extent to which in that scene, if you had read The Fountainhead first, which I hadn't done when I read it, that Dagny is Howard Rourke <laughs> and uh, Francisco Donquemia seems a lot like Dominique. This idea of, you know, the world is rotten, so I'm going to deliberately, I'm going to bring it down faster and deliberately destroy it. Uh, so there's, you know, that, that sort of switch that, you know, that, that uh, the, the female lead in that, in that case is the Howard Rourke character. She, uh, Dagny is out there doing her work done her way and, uh, you know, doggedly persisting uh, uh, in, in the face of opposition. And uh, so Dagny is, I think, is very much an, an antipode to Dominique in terms of her basic psychological motivation. And that's why I'm on team Dagny and not team Dominique. <laughs> but I'm trying here to sort of wrap my head around where is Dominique coming from? And why is it that, that the, you know, when she basically, she sees how it works, she understands, you know, at first sight, she immediately understands what kind of man he is. Why is it that she, she wants and needs to have that relationship consummated in this particularly strange way. All right. So, um, and I think, you know, now another understanding the character, what we have to understand is that she wants Howard work, but she doesn't want to have to also like, she doesn't want to have to admit to wanting it or to admit to, uh, uh, it's like a breakdown for her because she said, if I found in the previous section, that we talked about. She said, if I found something, a project I wanted or a person I wanted, then I'd job. be tied to the whole world. If I found a job mm -hmm. or a project or a person that I wanted, and that's mm -hmm. foreshadowing there, where she mm -hmm. says specifically a person that I wanted. So, you know, the person's going to show up a couple chapters later, right? So we're setting up, if, if I found something I wanted, I'd be tied to the whole world. And I would, you know, that would basically, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. 
Well, suddenly she finds a person she wants. And she finds him, you know, I, I've mentioned uh, last week, I mentioned that, you know, why does Rourke have to go off to the quarry? Well, he has to go off to the quarry for a number of reasons, but mainly so that Dominique can find him there specifically. Yeah. She can't meet him first at Kiki Holcomb's salon when he's a, a sell, you know, when he's got an architect who's just gotten a big job. She has to meet him at first when he's in the worst, lowest possible, you know, this is the nightmare she has. Here's the ideal man, and he is working like a convict at a granite quarry. So he, the ideal man in the worst possible situation, the lowest possible, you know, rung of the ladder in 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 society. So this is her worst fears realized. Uh, it's it's a total validation of her her whole her, her excuse me her whole worldview that the world is a rotten place, and the ideal man, of course, would be found doing the worst rottenest kind of job, you know, uh, uh, you know at, at, at the low end of the totem pole. Um, so because of that, she, she wants him, but she also wants to resist wanting him because that's her whole thing of, I do not want to be tied to the world, especially a world where this, you know, godlike figure is, is in the granite, is working in a granite quarry. Uh, and I think the best analogy I can think of is I remember reading something. Uh, it, it's going to be a perfect analogy because it, it has to do with sort of societies like you know Catholic societies and societies where there's a very repressive view of sexuality, a very puritanical view of sexuality. And I remember reading something about how um, I think it was in Japanese culture that that the the rape fantasy is like a thing in Japanese culture. And it comes from the fact that there's this, a, a, a widespread puritanical view towards sexuality where uh, women are not supposed to want sex. And so the thing is because they actually do <laughs> want it, but they know they're not supposed to want it, the rape fantasy becomes an outlet for that, for saying, um, well, you know, I, I, you get to have the sexuality and the sexual pleasure, but because it's forced on you, you're not really responsible for it. Right. So you it's that idea of, you know, I, I get to have it, but I get to have it without the guilt because it wasn't, you know, I didn't really consent to it. Uh, but that's, you have that fantasy. And I think that's the best way for understanding this scene with Dominique and why it is that she, she wants to consummate her relationship with Rourke in this particular way. Uh, that now it doesn't come from Puritanism, a Puritanical view of sexuality, because she makes it very clear beforehand what she says to Peter, I'd like, I kind of like to be a dissolute woman, uh, but she just can't actually, you know, find uh, men like Peter interesting. Uh, but uh, so it's not coming from Puritanism, but it's coming from that Stoicism, that sort of Epictetus style Stoicism. I know Stoicism, by, you know, people are going to object. I know Stoicism comes in a variety of different interpretations, but there's that sort of Epict hardcore Epictetus style socialism, uh, sorry, Stoicism, where it's, you know, you, you, you do not, you shouldn't want anything, you shouldn't have any desires, any ties to the world, uh, because every tie to the world enslaves you, and, uh, you know, you, you should focus only on what you can control, which is your own internal mental state. And that's sort of the, that stoicist, that stoic outlook is basically what she articulates earlier on here. So coming from that, it's the idea that she doesn't want to want, she wants Rourke, but she doesn't want to sort of admit to or accept wanting him. So she has to consummate the relationship with him in this forcible way where she you know, makes all the outward signs and sort of goes through all the motions of resisting him. Except of course, as I pointed out, except for doing anything that would actually stop it. Uh, <laughs> so it's, like I said, this is, I have to work hard intellectually to get into this mindset, right? And to understand Dominique. And that's sort of, when I say I'm not on team Dominique, it's because it's because she's a character where I don't have this self-identification with her. It's a very different psychology. I'm I'm a I'm a Dagny person, uh, a very different psychology from Dominique. So I have to sort of intellectually get myself into that mindset. And one of the odd aspects of this mindset too that you'll notice is that there's a lot of emphasis on the idea of um, uh, in her sort of in the sexual relationship we have with, she has with Rourke, there's a lot of emphasis on the idea of humiliation or of the abasement mm -hmm. and that she gets pleasure from that aspect of it, which again, I, you know, being a Dagny person, I found weird. But I also think it comes from the fact that, you know, this is, if you go make this analogy to sort of the more puritanical views of sex. Now, like I said, she's coming from a 
um, Dominique is coming from the Stoic aspect, not the Puritanical Christian. But in the in the Puritanical uh, uh, view of sex, it, there's often that same phenomenon. And the idea is if you if you view sex as humiliating and abasing, you will find humiliation and abasement sexy, right? So you know she finds sexual pleasure in the aspect of the domination and the humility and the, and the abasement that comes from it because she has this idea that you know to to want another person is abasing it's it's dragging her down it's tying her to this awful rotten world um so like i said that's uh, me trying to get into the dominique mindset and understand why it is that she has this reaction to things even though i can't really quite um quite get my i can get there intellectually i can't connect to her psychologically um, the way I do with some of the other characters. Um, all right, so that's sort of covering what I think is an interesting aspect of the, uh, of, of the, the big, the, 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 this, the Dominique and Rourke sex scene uh, that dominates, you know, the story that dominates the first couple chapters here. Now we get back after that, your work is called back for the Enright House um, I do think it's interesting that, you know, prior to this, there's been this discussion with work and, and people about how other people don't have that bigger presence. There's a great scene with Austin Heller where he says, Heller says, you know, it's, a, it, you don't, you know, when you, you don't, um, you know, he and Heller are friends, but Heller says to him, you know, I've observed that uh, uh, you don't really think about how it is that I see you. And work says, well, that's true. And then there's this pause in the conversation. And then Heller says, that's typical. Yeah. He says, what? That you wouldn't ask me what how it is that I see you. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, the cop comes up and he doesn't, Bork uh, wouldn't even think of, 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 of following up on, oh, so how do you see me, Heller? You know, he just has no interest whatsoever. But then when he gets the call from uh, Enright and he's going back, he has this moment where he realizes that I'm still thinking of Dominique. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even while I'm heading off and this is the big opportunity and, you know, he's going back to architecture, he realizes he has this moment, plus I'm still thinking of Dominique. So it is a big change in Rourke's character that happens here, which is there is another person who has a constant and important and you know, sort of um, continuing presence, psychological presence in his life, which has never really happened to him before. Uh, so I think it's an interesting change in his character. Now we get then the second section I wanted to talk about is the first meeting. Oh, do you set me up for this? And then I moved it, didn't I? Oh. No, I've not got here. No, I've got here. Um, Oops. The first meeting between Ellsworth Tui and Peter Keating and uh, the Temple of Nikkei Apteros. Now Sherry's going to have a few things to say about the Temple of Nikkei Apteros later on. But what I love about this is it's the first meeting and Tui knows how important this is for Keating. And so the first thing he throws at him is, hello, Peter Keating, said Ellsworth Monkton Tui in his compelling magical voice. What do you think of the temple of Nikkei Apteros? How do you do, Mr. Tui, said Keating, <laughs> stopped, stupefied. What do I think of, of what? Sit down, my friend, of the temple of Nikkei Apteros. Well, well, I, <laughs> I feel certain you couldn't have overlooked that little gem. The Parthenon has usurped the recognition which, and isn't that usually the case, the bigger and stronger appropriating all the glory, while the beauty of the unprepossessing goes unsung, which should have been awarded to that magnificent creation of the great free spirit of Greece. You've noted, I'm sure, the fine balance of its mass, the supreme perfection of its modest proportions. Ah, yes, you know, the supreme and the modest, the delicate craftsmanship of detail. Yes, of course, muttered Keating. That's always been my favorite the temple of Nikkei Apteros. Really, said Ellsworth Tui, with a smile which Keating could not quite classify. I was certain of it. I was certain you'd say it. And I love, he says, I was certain of it. I was certain you'd say it. And that's really what this is all about, right? He throws the temple, it's clear, he throws the temple of Nikkei Apteros at him, full well knowing he will have no idea off the top of his head what it is. And it's clear that Keating doesn't, that he stumbles through. But the whole purpose of it is He's he's trying to peg Peter Keating right off the bat. Find out he's he put up he puts up a second hander test. You know mm -hmm. how much is this person a conformist? How much is he just telling me what I want to hear? So I'm going to throw at him an obscure building that he won't remember and tell him that I, I think he ought to think it's the best thing. And I know that he will say, 
that that's true that he'll tell me what I want to hear so that's that's key that's that's also Ratui in a nutshell the, the way he just he he he's very perceptive and and he'll throw out little tests at people and test them to see what kind of person they are and he, right off the bat he does that with Peter um now by the way why does he pick Temple of DK after us so yes uh, I know Sherry's going to talk about more later I'm not trying not to steal anything but it's clear from the way he describes it, he chooses it because it's lesser. That is, you know, he praises he praises something because it is the lesser, the smaller, the more modest thing, and that's also key to his whole outlook and approach. Uh, and I think that uh, it's a subtle thing, but the, that reminded me and tied into uh, a little bit earlier in here, at the very beginning, beginning of chapter three, just a few pages before this meeting with Peter Keating. There's a discussion about his uh, his one small voice column in the banner, hmm. and uh, uh, one small thing was subtitled "Songs and Things Today" and was devoted to proving the superiority of folk songs over any other form of musical art, and of choral singing over any other manner of mu musical rendition. Now, again, this is another thing. The key here is praising the smaller or lesser above the greater. And the folk music thing is part of that. Now, this actually ties in to a whole strain of sort of left of center thinking at the time that Ayn Rand was writing this. So there's a reason why all the hippies in the 1960s were really into folk music. Because starting, especially in the 1930s, uh, there was this attempt on the sort of on the left, on the, on the cultural and political left, there was this, uh, this push to promote folk music. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that, that, uh, so I, I just did some research on this a while back, uh, a year or so ago. Uh, so an Ayn Rand's notes for the Fountainhead, uh, her, you know, her personal notes in her journal, when she was writing the novel, she's trying to describe the characters and what she's trying to do with the characters. What she says of Tui is, he says that he is fighting Rockefeller and Morgan, but he is fighting Beethoven and Shakespeare. Now, Rockefeller and Morgan are, you know, the great industrialist John D. Rockefeller and the great financier J.P. Morgan, late 19th century, you know, rich, wealthy and powerful men. Um, so, you know, they're the targets of, of economic hatred from the left. But what he's really fighting is Beethoven and Shakespeare. What she means by that is anybody who has an, ex is an individual with an extraordinary talent. And what she tried to do is tear down the extraordinary individual. So in... Uh, I wrote an article about a year or so ago. I wrote this in regard to somebody who was attacking Beethoven from the sort of modern politics, the modern left-wing politics of, of uh, racial politics, when they were saying, oh, well, this guy was saying that uh, uh, Beethoven is no more than a, a maybe a, a slightly above average composer who's been unjustly foisted upon us as a great man and a titanic genius, uh, you know, because, because of white supremacy, you know, which if you've Anyway, I, I'm not even going to bother, I critiqued that in this article, but in doing that, I looked up some of this stuff and I quoted Ayn Rand about the uh, Beethoven and Shakespeare being Tui's targets. And also looked up that in the 1930s, there was a guy named Alan Lomax, who was one of the people promoting folk music on the left. And he did it specifically because it was equalitarian. Mm -hmm. He says it was a people's culture, a culture of the common man. Right, so folk music was adopted as a fashion by the left in starting in the 1930s, specifically because it is the culture of the common man. Or um, for those who are familiar with Tom Lehrer, uh, the satirical guy, he wrote the satirical songs. No, I'm not going to sing it. He wrote who satirical songs in the 60s and 70s, but he had a comment where he said, "Wants See? to." No, they want I, you to right, sing. Fine. He had a comment about how um, uh, he says the the reason why folk, so many folk songs are so bad is because they were written by the people. <laughs> and he then he has the whole satirical thing where he then has like what would what would oh my darling clementine sound like if it were done by mozart right he goes to this whole thing and uh yeah he, he has all another song where he makes fun of the the folk song protest culture and things like uh what was it uh the lyrics don't have to be clever and it doesn't matter if you put a couple extra syllables into a line <laughs> it sounds more ethnic if it ain't good english and it don't even got a rhyme uh <laughs> All right, so I did a little singing. That's all you're going to get today. Um, Thank you. All right. Uh, I think it's, 
Now I'm trying to remember, I think much later on, by the way, I think we get a reference to, to, um, to, uh, uh, I think it's in, in the part on, uh, anyway, a reference to uh, Wagner's song to the evening star being rewritten mm -hmm. as a popular tune. And she sort of sees that as a form of vandalism mm -hmm. uh, of, of a great song. And so when we get to that, I might sing the song to the evening star to you, Ooh. Uh, <laughs> which is actually a very good song. Anyway, so what she's doing here in bringing in this, and oh, and the and says chorale singing over any other manner of musical rendition. So chorale singing is if any if you've ever been to a church if you've ever been to church you know what chorale singing is you you go to sing the hymn it's people all singing together as a group and of course it totally fits in with Tui's outlook that people singing together as a group rather than singing as an individual would you know he would prefer that uh, and this one that reference especially if some of them sang as poorly yeah. as I do <laughs> well that's it's good to have that covered up by the rest of the group. Um, but the, uh, this put me in mind of a piece by Chopin that I'm actually working on right now on the piano. It's his Nocturne in G minor. Uh, he wrote two Nocturnes in G minor. This is the later one, Opus 37, number one, I think. But the interesting thing about it is that the, 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 the piece begins uh, very Chopin, very typical Chopin Nocturne, this you know, single melodic line uh, ornamented and very introspective. And it's, it has this very sense of a very private and uh, introspective, it, private, personal, internal uh, spirituality. And then the middle section, because it usually switches to a slightly different melody in the middle section. The middle section is, it's a chorale. <clears throat> it's march, It's these chords marching along. It's the group singing together. It is, it absolutely, I mean, from the very first note, it absolutely sounds like you were in church on Sunday. And so he has this middle section, then he goes back to that introspective individual voice. And you can sort of see that as Chopin playing with these, you know, contrasting these two kinds of spirituality. There's the formal uh, group, the formal spirituality done publicly in a group in a formalized way in church, that's the middle section. And then before and after it, there is the individual voice sort of uh, work, struggling through its own thoughts and being very introspective. So it's the individual versus the group spirituality that you see in that nocturne. And you know, his is Tui coming out in favor of the group. All right, so he's, so we're already establishing here some of the themes of Tui, that he, he praises the lesser above the greater and the group over the individual. But he's also, again, with this Nikkei Aptros thing, he's he's giving Peter tests. And he's really, he's like, I like to see he's fluoroscoping Peter. I mean, oh. he's, he's x-raying him completely in, in this first, uh, in this first meeting. Uh, and he does things like, uh, there's a great passage a little farther in here. It says, uh, where Keating is thanking him for writing this great article about his uh, praising the Cosmos Sotnik building. But I was so happy that you thought I'm a great architect, but surely, my boy, you knew that. Or weren't you quite sure? Never quite sure of it. <laughs> well, I, it was only a second's pause. And it seemed to Keating that this pause was all Tui had wanted to hear from him. Tui did not wait for the rest, but spoke as if he had received the full answer and an answer that pleased him, right? So he, again, he's x-raying Peter Keating and just totally getting inside his psychology um, uh, during this section. But, you know, the, 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 I was also going to mention with the, the uh, you know, the Nikki Aptaros and then also the stuff about folk music, Ayn Rand is giving us really a full portrait of the red decade intellectual, right? So Ayn Rand came to the U.S. in 1926 from Soviet Russia. And she came here just in time <laughs> for communism to have this incredible vogue to be this uh, trend or fad among the intellectuals in the 1930s. And it was actually the 30s was later coined the red decade because of the popularity of communism. And so with Tui, she's really giving us the full length portrait of a red decade intellectual with all this sort of, the, and, and the thing that distinguishes Tui is the consistency of it. Uh, uh, Peter Keating is a collectivist in his soul. He's a collectivist psychologically, but he's not a self-aware, he's not ideological. He's sort of pulled by his emotions to wanting to conform to other people and be affected by other people. Tui is the intellectual. He's the one who has this as a, it, it believes in collectivism, not just as a psychology, but as a theory 
And in, in and because of that, he pulls it together into a, consist, a consistent and coherent whole, something that incorporates his views on architecture and his views on music. So she's she's using that to give us the full, consistent, explicit ideology of collectivism being brought in here. Uh, now, uh, one of the things he does with Peter that I really, the last thing I want to mention here that is really jumps out at me from this section too, is having x-rayed Peter, then he goes to work on him. And he goes to work on him by planting little suggestions and little ideas. Um, and so, for example, when he find, you know, he talks to Peter about uh, Katie, uh, Tui's niece and, and uh, Peter's love interest, uh, he says, you know, he's, uh, he's talking about their, their love affair and he says, oh, it must have been spring, said Tui. It usually is. There's always a dark movie theater and two people lost to the world, their hands clasped together. But hands do perspire when held too long, don't they? <laughs> Still, it's beautiful to be in love, the sweetest story ever told and the tritest. Don't turn away like that, Catherine. We must never allow ourselves to lose our sense of humor. So he keeps putting all these little <laughs> digs in in this very passive aggressive way of putting it's these like, belittling it's like, comments. It's like um, Keating's mother. It's like Keating's mother, only more vicious. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the scene ends with, uh, you know, Catherine and, and, and Katie and, and, and Peter have been visiting Tui and the scene ends with them leaving together. When they walked, and there's this section here. When they walked out together, when they were alone in the cold brilliance of streets flooded with late sunlight, Keating felt himself recapturing everything Catherine had always meant to him, the strange emotion which he could not keep in the presence of others. He closed his hand over hers. She withdrew her hand, took off her glove, and slipped her fingers into his. And then he thought suddenly that hands did perspire when held too long, and he walked faster in irritation. He thought that they were walking there like Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and that they probably appeared ridiculous to the passersby. To shake himself free of these thoughts, he glanced down at her face. She was looking straight ahead at the gold light. He mm. saw her delicate profile and the faint crease of a smile in the corner of her mouth, a smile of quiet happiness. But he noticed that the edge of her eyelid was pale, and he began to wonder whether she was anemic. Now, all of these things are, are, are things planted into his head by Tui. Um, he the, let them get planted. Yeah, about the the, the hands perspiring, the Mickey the, about, the, about Mickey and Minnie Mouse, about uh, them looking ridiculous. You know, his man has, should be free. Uh, love is great because people should make fools of themselves and look ridiculous. And also about her being, about Katie being anemic. So you see all, and, and these have been, these, these things have been sprinkled in over the last 10 or 15 pages of the novel to these little comments from Tui, and you see them all coming together. And they come together specifically though, when he's recapturing everything Katie, that Katie had always meant to him. So it's the one thing in his life that Keating still values firsthand independently for himself. And Tui has already gone to work at him, Correct. making that one value he has seem small and ridiculous and making him renounce it. So you can see, and now, you know, Catherine, no, the other thing about Catherine is we, we see her at very irregular intervals and she seems to be sort of declining each mm -hmm. time we see her, right? And the reason she's declining each time we see her is that Keating, what Keating is getting is one-tenth of what she's getting being around Elizabeth Dewey all the time. It's the reason this, she ran away in the night. Yeah, this constant belittling, the constant undermining, the constant making you feel bad about the things that you value. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's really, it's the pattern of a, of a schoolyard bully because, you know, one of the, ridicule is one of the tools of a school, like schoolyard bully and specifically to find anything that you like, anything that you, um, that, you know, anything that a kid values, anything the kid likes and anything that he's enthusiastic about is then made a target for the ridicule of the schoolyard bully. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's the pattern of an abusive father, uh, an abusive parent or an abusive spouse, the constant belittling, the constant making, making the person feel small and ridiculous. And that is Tui's whole MO constantly with everybody who's around him. That's how he used, that's what he does to break other people down and make them basically the targets of, and the, and the victims of his abuse. Uh, so that's, I thought that was it, it's so brilliantly constructed yeah. the, the, and the way he, he, he does that from the very first beginning of his meeting with Peter and the way he's he's manipulating his psychology 
and how that's all captured in that one paragraph at the end about Mickey and Minnie Mouse. All right, so that's the main things. I've got some stuff to say about Lois Cook, but it's it's I had to cut something out. So maybe we'll get to it later. Um, and uh, all right, so we will. Uh, that's 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 my section, and then Shrik, yes. I also set Shrikant up nicely enough by yeah. by mentioning Beethoven. Yes. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to do first, uh, Sherry. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to do my presentation now. I'm going to hand it okay. over to you, but I want to do one tech test here. If I can use what the test? Board. Yeah. A tech test. Yeah. Can you? Okay. You can see me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. You're making That's squiggles. Better. I'm making squiggles. Okay, now how do I stop sharing? Give me a second here. They're a little light on the yellow, on the yellow on the white yeah, background. I will I'll figure all that out. Uh, okay. So go ahead here. Uh, I'm going to start from here. Share and stop share. Okay, tech okay. test done. The floor is all yours. Go right ahead. Okay. We interrupt this message <laughs> for a quick tech test. Okay. That's great, Shrikan. Um, I have a few different things I wanted to talk about today. One, um, we're going to take a little, um, I like to give a signposting, as Rob likes to mention. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about color and um, some contrasts that um, kind of looking at uh, these chapters, the way you might look at a painting or a piece of sculpture. And then we're going to take a little side venture into um, some sculpture. Uh, and then we'll wrap up my section on uh, the Temple of Nike after us. So the first thing I wanted to bring up here was um, if anybody has seen or read or heard of me doing a review of a work of art or something before, I often talk about contrasts, that contrasts are a way that our eyes are brought or our mind is brought to our attention on one particular topic. And um, my reading these chapters has really been struck in, in, in that way. And there's a few different um, elements here that I want to make sure these are the little details that you're noticing too. So one of the first things I wanted to mention here is the, the words that Ayn Rand is using in this first chapter of part two, when she talks first about Rourke and then she talks about Dominique. And I want, I'm just gonna point out some of the, um, the words. I'm not gonna, I'm, they're, they're gonna be separated, um, but I'll just talk about Rourke's words first and then Dominique's words. And that hopefully will help you remember some of the contrast and what she's doing. Remember she worked in the movies and I honestly think all of her work is very visual. Um, it's very much feel like there is um, a screen, uh, uh, a picture forming when you read her words. So we arrive here at the beginning of this section with Rourke in the quarry. And we're using these words like hot stone in the sun. Uh, his face was scorched to bronze. His shirt stuck in long, damp patches to his back. Uh, a world without curves, grass, or soil. Stone planes, sharp edges, and angles. And then there's the words of the stone she's talking about. Molten mass cooling too slowly. And the stone having been flung, forced out of the earth still held in the shape of violence against the violence of the men on the ledges. So getting this very dark, sharp, hot kind of sense. We then hear about where he's living and we hear paint is peeling, their naked boards, it's a gray white. And then we hear about the kitchen with the fumes of grease crackling eternally on the vast gas range. So we keep getting these senses. We get in further on a little bit later when, um, let's see, 204, a little further on when we're in the quarry again and Dominique shows up there and that we're getting the sense because this is summer. It's on, this clearly is a, a granite that must have fairly dark in color because it's reflecting so much heat. Um, 
And she, she writes here, thrust into an execution chamber filled with scalding steam, <laughs> um, that they're broken, um, the heat didn't come from the sun, but it was broken from the broken cuts in the earth, that the air shimmered below with sparks of fire shot through the granite. She thought the stone was stirring, melting, and running in white trickles of lava. So we have these two, both the very first time when, when Rourke is in the quarry by himself, and the second time we come back there when Dominique sees him in the quarry, both times it's all about this hot, bronze, dark, sharp angles. But notice what this is contrasting to. So we're gonna go back here to, um, the very beginning, this is on page 203, when we first see Dominique in the country house. And we are getting completely different picture. We were getting descriptions of shallow crystal bowl stood with a pool of light and a single water lily spreading white petals like a drop of candle fire. And then we find that when she gets to her bedroom, she finds fragile lace folds of her nightgown laid out. And in her bathroom is the sunken bathtub with pool of water with hyacinth odor of her bath salts and aquamarine blue tiles polished and shining under her feet. Huge towels spread out like snowdrifts. <laughs> um, these are complete opposite pictures. Um, we hear later uh, she's um, when Dominique is there at the quarry that her dress is the color of water, pale green blue. And once I got to this, I, I kept seeing this, these very different kinds of hot, scorching, dusty, dirty heat and this delicate Venetian glass cool, cool, cool of water, delicate, beautiful perfumes of hyacinths and lilies. And the contrast is something we couldn't, it, it, you can't quite, you can't miss it. Um, and then I thought, okay, it's time for us to bring up a contrast of color. So can you do a share screen yeah. now for me? And I thought it's not only do we have a contrast in these textures, uh, but we're getting, oh, oh we got to go, way, we back gotta go way back. Yeah. Next one. Um, here we are. So here's a color wheel. So there, and I don't know, um, I'm hoping Iris might be able to give us a little more information on how much of an understanding of color Ayn Rand had. Um, but the, something interesting happens on um, any color wheel. Um, you've all seen one of these, I'm sure. Um, we keep getting these colors of ice blue of, she talks about the glass in, in, in her apartment um, later on about it feeling like, um, like a ribbon of cool green glass. Glass on its, regular glass on its edge always has this sort of cool blue green color to it. But notice here on the color wheel, we have um, opposites along the color wheel, like say, say, well, for example, here I'm wearing green and, and the wall behind me is red. They're not bright like Christmas green and red, but you'll notice on the color wheel, they're opposites. Well, the red and the green, because they're complementary colors, they cause almost um, an extra energy among the two of them. The two together, usually make a color, they're called complementary color pairs because they not because they complement one another, but because they complete one another. The two colors mixed together, if they were light through a prism, would make white light. If their paints mixed together, they would of course darken to something like, like black or close to it. So we keep getting this reference to these blue-green colors uh, when it's referring to Dominique, referring to her apartment, to the glass on her bathroom table, uh, the color of her dress. But yeah, what's her dresses really... are always these pale, icy blue greens. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
Um, but what notice here is what's opposite on the color wheel from these blue green colors is orange. And so of course we know Howard Rourke is known for his bright orange hair at the very beginning of the book. Well, notice in this section of chapters, how many times orange comes up again and again. I think probably five times it comes up in this group of chapters. So, um, and this is an invitation, invitation to Iris to talk to, I think it's coming next. Um, I wanted to show you quite how important these colors were to Ayn Rand. Um, go ahead next. Uh, this was her house and you'll notice- This is her house in California. Yeah, thank you. You'll notice the walls are painted in this blue green color, but what's the other color that's in there? Pops of bright orange. So this is something that was a deeply personal, I think. I mean, these are colors that I personally find um, very soothing and exciting at the same time to me too. So um, you wanna stop screen yeah. here? So we have both physical description contrast, we have color description contrast, um, and then we also have a sort of sense of life contrast. Remember last time I talked about how with Katie and with Peter, we keep seeing them have a sense of life reaction to something, sort of that gut level reaction to something. And they deny it always. They turn away from it. They uh, ignore it. They do the opposite. They, it's, it's, it's striking all the way through. Well, we have a couple more situations of sense of life reactions among our characters. And we have Tui's reaction when he finally sees Rourke. Notice he can't keep his eyes off of Rourke at the party. And he's quite uncomfortable about the situation. Also, we have a situation where the artist Mallory uh, shoots at, at Tui. And the thing that, re that, that Tui reacts to most is the question of why. He has a sense of life reaction to that. Um, then notice the sense of life reactions we have of Howard Rourke. After his, he's met Dominique, he notices that she keeps coming up in his thoughts. When he's not trying to think, that thought comes into his head. And we notice at one point that that thought comes to his head when he's thinking of working on the Enright house, when he's thinking of the highest value, that thought comes to him, he recognizes it and is kind of like intrigued by it. Like, oh, that's interesting. He's not denying it. He's not turning away from it. He's not making a judgment. He's just observing his own reaction and moving forward with it. But we have something different that happens with Dominique. She, this, this group of sections, keeps having this sense of life reaction. And she's a little bit the way Peter is in that she's denying it, but there's other reasons for it. And as we get later on towards the end, to the end of the Kiki Holcomb's party, she is dealing with that sense of life reaction to Rourke, realizing who he is. And she's having a difficulty um, then there's another scene where um, she's at the, uh, the with when we meet Lois Cook. Uh, there is a, a part when Peter and she, she shows up to the American Builders uh, description that, that, oh, that the, meeting. The, she, where um, uh, Dominique shows up. Yeah, Dominique shows up. And, and Peter realizes another sense of life reaction that Dominique doesn't belong. She walks in and kind of dissolves the whole sense of camaraderie in the room. She just dissipates it just by her very presence. She doesn't belong in there. Um, but she has that kind of reaction uh, also. She's, she's realizing um, that she's affected by Howard Rourke's presence in her life and she wants to fight it. And, but she at the same time is recognizing She's the one who's realizing I'm having this kind of reaction. And she says to Peter later on, um, 
we learn so much about ourselves. And she has this line where she's talking to Peter, it'll be worse for you, <laughs> which we'll see later. <laughs> oh yeah, when he learns about himself, it'll be worse it'll for be him. It'll be worse right? for him. <laughs> yes. So as we continue, keep paying attention to uh, those contrasts, um, both in color and in description, um, but also in the sense of life reactions of the characters. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was this description of Mallory's build of his sculpture of industry. Let me pull it up here. So Mallory, we're brought, we're, he's introduced very quickly. Um, Mr. Slotnick chooses Mallory to do the sculpture in the Cosmo Slotnick building because Dimples Williams lives in it, <laughs> which is a hilarious detail, even the detail that her name is Dimples, right? Um, but this description we have of this, uh, this sculpture that he does, a, he does a rough model for the sculpture. It's essentially a proposal to do the piece. Um, Mallory had been hired, had worked and submitted a model of his statue of industry. When he saw it, Keating knew that the statue would look like a raw gash, like a smear of fire in the neat elegance of his lobby. It was a slender naked body of a man who looked as if he could break through the steel plate of the battleship and through any barrier, whatever. It stood like a challenge. It left a strange stamp on one's eyes. It made people around it seem smaller and sadder than usual. For the first time in his life, looking at that statue, Keating thought he understood what was meant by the word heroic. So I wanted to take a little moment here and let you guys know how common sculptures of industry and sculptures that valued industry at this time, they were extraordinarily popular. And so I'm gonna give you a little tour of a few. Um, this one, um, when Rob and I lived in Chicago, we lived in uh, Printer's Row area, which was um, a set of loft apartments where the old printing presses used to be. And this was hanging on our wall. This is um, an advertising poster from the 20s, I think 26. Oh, I thought you said 25. Maybe 25? Yeah. Um, and this was for the South Shore line that we left from Chicago and took you down to the South Shore, probably Northern India. Northern India, yeah. So notice the detail here. This is the whole cityscape down below with- It's Gary, Indiana, all the steel, all the steel, all mills. The steel mills. And you can see that the image kind of forms out of the smoke and it makes this color contrast again, in this particular case, the background is sort of like a grayish blue and the words Workshop of America, the red on the anvil and the highlights in all of the buildings, this orangey red color are color complements. They pop more because of their positioning on the opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, so this is one example of what was, I mean, this was advertising at the time. This was really common to see workers uh, portrayed in such a way. Um, and these are a series of photos by Louis Hine, who uh, photographed, you have my, um, okay, hang on, I've got a, I've got a, oh, you got Rob, a Rob stole my computer. I gotta find my page. Hang on a second. Um, when Lewis Hine, this is a, a, a famous photographer. If you don't recognize this particular picture, you will recognize the other pictures in just a second. Um, Lewis Hine was a photographer, an excellent technical photographer, but also quite artistic in, in portraying a sense of life in his images. Um, here's a quote from his book, which came out in 32. Uh, he says in the introduction, I will take you into the heart of modern industry where machines and skyscrapers are being made, where the character of a man is being put into the motors, the airplanes, the dynamos upon which the life and happiness of millions of us depend. 
So this is one of his pictures. Um, if and, you, and by the way, we know that, that Ayn Rand had this book. Yes, she owned a copy of this book. And if you read the descriptions of uh, the first times you see Howard Rourke working as a rivet catcher, when you see, when you read the descriptions of him working in the granite quarry, when you read the descriptions of high rise sculptures or high rise buildings being built, think of these pictures because these would have been things she's seen. Uh, so here's another, this one, I'm sorry for the Getty images, but sometimes um, the images are reproduced so many times you lose the quality of the photo. Of the photo. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, I think this one's called Lunch on the Skyscraper. It's something like that. Yeah. Um, and this literally was how, <laughs> this is how they actually behaved. They walked around up on these beams and girders high above the city without any safety gear. Um, it's just what they did. Um, and this is perhaps one of my favorites. This one is called uh, Line Boy. No, Sky Boy. Sky Boy, Sky Boy. Sorry, I got my names mixed up. Um, but there is, um, he, there, if you ever get a chance to see an exhibit of his photographs that occasionally go around to some of the smaller museums around the country, um, or if you can get a hold of one of the first editions, which are extremely rare, um, that's certainly worth it. But I also wanted, since we're talking here about titans of industry, I wanted to bring up yet another. This is Cincinnati's Temple to Transportation. This was built in the 30s, right at the same time she was doing her work. Um, and this was a really fascinating project. It's a railroad. A railroad. Well, it's a whole transportation temple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was some like five or seven or nine um, railroad tycoons all came together independently and built uh, this massive transportation temple. And they called it a temple. Um, you can see in the front, no, no penny was spared in the construction of this. Um, I'll show you, here's a picture and then and you can see, uh, it kind of looks like a Hollywood set. This is a whole series of fountains that cascade down in the front. Um, and here is, just so you all know, uh, it went into sad disrepair for many, many years, but has um, undergone fairly recently um, a whole new um, restoration project, and it was very expensive. Uh, and there's now houses, museums, uh, you can still take the Amtrak train, um, mm. which certainly doesn't feel like it fits <laughs> anymore. The, anymore, but, but the, and I'm, I'm, I'll show you another picture of these uh, front pieces in a second here, but um, it has been restored. So it's certainly something uh, to take a, a, a stop and see if you're ever in Cincinnati. But what's interesting is inside, these uh, is a very much an art deco monument here. Uh, you can see art is incorporated everywhere. And these, uh, these murals that are along the walls, some of the murals are painted. These I believe are all done in glass mosaics. And you'll see just to the uh, left of center, you'll see a man standing on um, an I-beam during a construction process. And to the right of center, um, there is uh, several different types of workers, all sorts of things happening. River boats. River boats are happening. Um, you see Zeppelins in the left? Possibly. Um, and this is a, even so you can see up to the top. Um, and the, out front again, this is the temple um, of, of transportation. So of course we have a goddess of transportation. Um, and I, I don't know, can we not share for a second? What do we want to do uh, here? Hold on. And you can see the train at her feet yep. there. You can see the train and at the her cog, feet. Some sort of cog wheel in the background. And I'm going to stop the share for a second to share you can see something Yeah. Else. So, and not oh. only, um, there we go. It has, um, oh, it has made its way into um, works of art. Um, and and pieces of of jewelry. So this is a recreation. It's a brooch. Let me show you the backside. So it's got a pin and you and a little ring at the top, so you can wear it as a pendant. But this is um, 
the recreation of the temple uh, or the uh, yeah. goddess of transportation. The Greek from the, goddess of rail transport. Yeah, the Greek goddess of rail transport. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another example. Um, and so as, let's go back to share. Yeah. Um, there we go, hit play. Um, and as we go on to um, later things, I'm hoping that Rupali will bring up this topic about how Montessori's focus on work is really an important part of this. Um, one of the things that uh, we'll see if, if we dig into the art of this time is, it, is it, it doesn't have a solid philosophical underpinning. So eventually it sways um, in World War II, um, this kind of architecture is picked up by the Nazis, uh, art and architecture and by uh, the Soviets. So it loses some of its um, strength then and, and, and has uh, things that these things happen. It changes happen. to a somewhat different theme. It changes, yes. <laughs> this is a sad thing that happens when art is uh, um, dis divorced from its philosophical underpinnings. Um, but the last thing I wanted to talk about here was the temple of Nike Aptros. And again, this is in the theme of a lot of the things I'm talking about, which is pay close attention to the details. Great works of art always are, just, you are always rewarded for looking deeper. Um, the more you look, the more you can see. So we have this example of the temple of Nike Aptros. So has anybody ever taken, when they read this book, taken the time to put the book down and go look up what the heck is the Temple of Nike Aptros? <laughs> Maybe it was just me. <laughs> but um, the temple, so we are, I'm giving you an example here. This is the Acropolis, an aerial view of the Acropolis. Um, I don't have a pointer that works, but I don't think that will be yeah. an issue. Oh yeah, that works. You can see my, my You can see the cursor. Little arrow. Can anybody see the cursor? Well, everybody knows where the Pantheon is, right? Or the, the Parthenon. Parthenon, excuse me. Everybody sees the Parthenon in the top. Um, can we annotate? What does this do? We can't see this uh, yeah. cursor. I, I think she's got it now. Does this work? Can you see it now? Oh, oh nope, back sorry. her up. Okay, well, I'll just point because I can do that. Yeah. Um, or I'll just scribe. Um, so at the top of this Acropolis, everyone knows the Acropolis, in the, the upper corner, uh, a little bit off to the right, is the famous temple of the P Pantheon, Parthenon, oh, Parthenon. excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. I've been planning a trip to the Pantheon, so I've got my temples mixed up in my head. Sorry. So follow along to the very front in the lower right corner, and you see this battlement or this wall that goes straight down. Everybody see that in the front right corner? And then you see this little tiny temple on top that has four columns in the front and is missing its roof. Can everybody see that? That is the temple of Nike Apteros. <laughs> now, what's fascinating about this is when you're at the Acropolis, it's pretty hard to pull your attention away from the big temple <laughs> to see this little tiny thing that you can really only see as you're climbing up the stairs. There's more reason for Ayn Rand picking that specific temple than just because it's a little temple. That's an important, important point. Tui, as Rob said, is, is after praising the little and maybe slightly insignificant, but there's more to it. So let me show you a picture of the temple. Here's an old postcard from, um, from I don't know the date of this particular postcard. I'm guessing like 1910-ish. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you notice in the bottom, it's labeled Temple of Nike Apteros, Athens. What's interesting is that it got this name possibly accidentally from a second century tour guide, which referred to the temple of Nike Aptros because the author saw Nike or victory. victory without wings. So Aptros means wingless. 
So I'll show you another couple pictures here. Where was going on? Why is it not doing this, Rob? Okay, here's a painting from about the early uh, 1900s. Um, it, oh, this was it that late? I thought it was earlier. Anyway, go ahead. I've gotten a couple different paintings pulled okay. up here. Um, and here is a picture of how it looks today. Now you can see some of the roof is back up. And if you notice these white bits of stone, the building has been rebuilt three times <laughs> since the 1830s, completely and totally torn down to the ground and rebuilt because as they try to restore, they make terrible mistakes in their restoration project. But what's interesting, and we're gonna go back here to the temple of, or not the temple, the, the winged victory, and you can see the importance of this choice in this particular building. She is choosing the wingless victory. Now, think about that in referring to Peter Keating. So at this point, he's the celebrated victor of the story, but it's false. So I think that it's not a coincidence that she chose the temple of Nike Aptros or the temple of wingless victory, because we are gonna start seeing as time goes on, those wings getting clipped in poor Peter. <laughs> um, so again, when you read, read deeply because there's much more to be had. How do I stop share? Um, See, I can talk, but I can't stop share and share and all that at the same time. So, so as you keep reading, start thinking of that. Sherry, that was just wonderful. I had not made that connection at all. It's just <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. It gives it sends tingles down your spine, doesn't it? Yes. yes. Um, all right, folks. Uh, next up is going to be Iris, Rupali, and Joya. Iris. Iris, you need to unmute. Uh, give me just a second, okay? I want to make sure that you can. Hold on. Okay, now try. Can you try unmuting? Yes. 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 Thank you. I uh, let's see the dress. I'm going to start with the dress that Dominique wore the first time she and Rourke saw each other. It's a pale green blue, the color of water. Those are all Rand's words, and. Uh, I just want to start with what's going on on the color wheel for these, these colors. Uh, start with blue, then you go to blue, green, then green, blue, then green. And green, blue, it, everyone keeps sending me emails calling it blue, green, which is much more common to hear in English. Uh, green, blue is a very unusual color for English speakers. It has a special name in Russian. It's three words, and it means the color of sea waves. I, uh, it's very hard for people to think about colors when they don't have names for them. I, we have a name for pink. It's very common in English. It's uncommon in other languages. In other languages, it's light red. Uh, English speakers do not think of pink as being light red. It's a different color of its own. Uh, for Russian speakers, green blue is a very specific color. It is. It has no relationship to blue or blue green. I uh, just another way of thinking about color. In Russian, they do not have a word for blue the way we do. Our blue is light blue, dark blue, all kinds of blues. Uh, they have no word for that, just as we have no word for red and pink together. Uh, for them, dark blue and light blue have different words. They're completely different. They don't think of them as having a relationship. Uh,
I, oh, just a quick aside, uh, it's fun, as I was looking at different cultures, Japanese, there is one word that is both blue and green. So they'd have no way of understanding the color of uh, Dominique's dress. Uh, And then Rand picked the color for the Objectivist newsletter. It is green blue. I offered her a whole series of colors and she had no trouble picking out the color she wanted. Now it's interesting to know that uh, for Russians is either light blue or dark blue. Uh, this color though, whether it's light or dark is seen as the same. So the difference between this very dark blue, dark green blue that Rand chose for the newsletter, uh, to us seems to have almost no relationship to the pale dress that Dominique was wearing. But to Rand, they were the same. They were the same color, it's amazing. Uh, and just a little bit about recent, some research I did, uh, it's something I've known about for years. I, men do not see as many variations in color as women do. Uh, it's uh, part of the development of their brain uh, uh, while they're developing in the womb. Uh, so these, some of these colors are very similar and uh, a lot of people would have trouble seeing that there's a difference between some of them. Rand instantly knew what she wanted. Oh, just fast aside, uh, uh, scientists now think that uh, the reason women see so many more colors than uh, that men is uh, that they have two sets of genes for color and men have only one. Uh, women can better distinguish fine differences in hearing, smell, and taste. And as to whether people all see the same color, uh, probably not. Uh, uh, people see different colors with different eyes. So you can test that yourself cover one eye and, and then the other, and you'll see that you're not seeing the same color with both. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Iris. I remember I had gone to Robin Sherry's once when Sherry just took this huge jar of pencils with hundreds of pencils, colored pencils in there. And let me talk to you about color. And so I, I remember that still after all these years. Uh, wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Rupali. Iris, thank you for that. Um, we recently painted our house and our house has painted blue with a red, orangish red door. And when we were painting the house, I had a specific blue in mind and my husband could not distinguish the shades. And he would send me a picture and I would say, that's not the right color. I mean, it's like, what do you mean? So now I understand why uh, husbands and wives fight over colors. <laughs> Thank you. As an architect, when I was practicing architecture, I would often see this conflict between uh, husbands and wives. I don't know if Sherry, you see that, but women are very specific about what they want. Um, so that, that was very good information. Thank you. So um, I'll tell you why I'm on Team Dominic. And not that I'm not on Team Dagny, but I met Dagny after I met Dominic. So I first um, read Fountainhead. And Dominic came across as very independent thinker, very complex, but uh, she, uh, she was able to understand the world around her. And although she feared and was scared of reaching the potential, the human potential, she actually goes through the transformation in the book. And um, there is at the end, uh, sorry for the spoiler, but there's an optimistic Dominique at the end. And so 
Uh, Rupali, um, feel free to, uh, it is, uh, we, we do not do, uh, you know, we, we basically don't worry about spoilers. You just okay. assume that everybody knows Fountainhead has read it at least 20 times. That's, that's the assumption. Okay. And there are, um, you know, she does what she pleases, uh, which was for a 16 year old me growing up in India, that was uh, a challenge because I didn't see, although my parents never told us we couldn't do anything, I didn't see that manifested in my aunts or uh, my cousins who uh, were starting out their own lives. And I felt that Dominique gave me that, uh, that ideal or that model that I could say, all right, there is a possibility. The other thing um, about Dominique was that she understood the social structure that Rourke didn't care for. And Rourke believes in himself, in his own potential, his ability to think and act on his own volition. And Dominique sees the social structure that can be harmful to men like Rourke. And um, I don't know so much about, you know, uh, how it was in the US, but India was very corrupt in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s. Um, it's still, there is a lot of corruption, but um, growing up, uh, while I was reading The Fountainhead, my father at the same time was starting a factory to make fertilizers. He had come up with new formulae, new ways of making fertilizers that would help farmers in famine struck areas. And famine was big back in the 70s and 80s in India. And he was able to come up with new formulation completely on his own thinking abilities. I would see him waking up from three in the morning to six in the morning working on these uh, formulations and then starting his day. And yet when he went to start his factory and I would tag along with him, I would go to these government offices where I would see people like Tuhi, people who could hold these men in power, right? Because they had the power to give him a license or a certificate of, uh, completion or whatever he needed the licenses for. And I would see these men and, and Ayn Rand captures to his personality so well, like this pompous man, but so little in stature. And I would see these government officials just like Dewey. And I would see my father dressed in simple clothes because he never spent extra money on his own um, his own uh, needs. And I would see him and I felt he was always bigger in the room than he was. And he's a very short man. Um, he's only 5'3". So yet he seemed larger in the room than all these other people. Now that could be because he was my dad, uh, but also I could see him through the lens of Fountainhead and through Dominic's eyes. Uh, and I, what I saw was, you know, he was starting a factory in this famine struck area where the soil was just hard and rocky. And there he was dreaming of creating this lush green oasis and he would talk about it. And he actually did over a span of 30 years, he built what he had envisioned, but he was always at the mercy of these men like Tuhi and the corruption that existed. So to me, I thought Dominic offered a way to handle these people because she could speak to Tuhi in a way, you know, there's always double speak. And I, I could see that why she was using that kind of language. And um, Rohit never got that, okay? Rohit just doesn't understand. <laughs> to me, uh, I feel that Dominique was able to kind of navigate um, the world of people like Tuhi who are just leeches. Um, I mean, they're just absolutely disgusting people and we meet them in real life. So, so hey, hooray for Team Dominique. And um, so uh, Rob did a great explanation about the intense uh, scenes between um, Roark and Dominique in the first two chapters of part two. I really had never thought of it as a rape effort until three years ago when I was talking to a young lady and I said, oh, you should read Fountainhead. And she said, why? The uh, main character rapes the lead lady and then 
And I was like, what, wait a minute, when was that happening? <laughs> and the reason it never occurred to me was because if you look at all the words that, uh, that lead to the intense um, relationship between them, you see Dominic wants it as much as Rourke wants it. And so every, um, every part in there, so I just start a little bit over here where there is the contrast and um, Sherry talked about contrast. Now, if you look at how he is described, um, the, the, uh, the house that he lives in, but then after dinner, sometimes after dinner, he would walk into the woods that began behind his house. He would, he would stretch out on the ground on his stomach, his elbows planted before him, his hands propping his chin, and he would watch the patterns of veins on the green blades of grass under his face. He would blow at them and watch the blades tremble and then stop again. He would roll on his back and lie still, still feeling the warm of, warmth of the earth um, under him. He pressed his hips back into the earth under him. The earth resisted, but it gave way. It was a silent victory. He, he felt a dim, sensuous pleasure in the muscles of his legs. And then uh, you see, she also would go for go on a walk. She walked on long, she walked on long after she was exhausted. She drove herself forward against the weariness of her muscles. Then she flung down, then she fell down on her back and lay still. Her arms and legs flung out like a cross on the ground, breathing in release, feeling empty and flattened, feeling the weight of the air like the pressure against her breast. It was the sound of this. And then she talks about um, the um, quarry, the blasting at the quarry. And she says, it was the sound of destruction and she liked it. Uh, she goes on, Ayn Rand goes on to say that Dominic walked into the quarry. The thought of seeing it on a blazing day was revolting and she enjoyed the prospect um, and so on and so forth. She talks about, um, you know, how, how Rourke, um, when Dominique says she knew it was the most beautiful face she would ever see because it was the abstraction of strength made visible. Um, she felt a convulsion of anger, of protest, of resistance and of pleasure. He looked upon, he stood looking up at her. It was not a glance, but an act of ownership. And so on and so forth, she leads, um, to, leads us to saying that their understanding was too offensively intimate because they had never said a word to each other. Why do you always stare at me? She asked sharply. For the same reason you've been staring at me. And so they know, um, they instinctively know uh, about each other's desires. But uh, so it was, it's only when she goes back to New York and she has this prospect of meeting all these people and saying that she was raped. And it's just mentioned in one line, um, but somehow it had never caught my attention until somebody had brought it upon me. And I had just wondered why this relationship starts off intimate, uh, is so intensely. And Rob, thank you for sharing the background behind it. Now this section uh, talks about the noble versus the ordinary part two. It's um, the contrast between Rourke and Tuhi or how Dominic um, and Tuhi understand the same uh, social structure, but how they both react to it differently. It also uh, talks about people like Keating, Lewis, Lewis uh, Cook and uh, Tuhi and their little clubs that are made up of ordinary people. There is no purpose to those clubs. There's no reason why they're getting together. And all they do is just this um, mentality of being a victim. The young men talked a great deal about injustice, unfairness, cruelty of society toward youth, and suggested that everyone should have his future commissions guaranteed when he left college. I mean, doesn't that sound like the entitled young people we have now? Um, why do we need to work? We should just be given because we exist. 
Um, Gordon L. Prescott declared that the AGA was a bunch of old foggies with no conception of social responsibility and not a drop of viral blood in a lot of them. And it was time to kick them in the pants anyway. So this is what we see even with the youth today. Some of them, I wouldn't say all of them, but it's a general feeling of, oh, poor me, and let's band together and collectively we can address um, our situation. And uh, one of the things that I notice with collectivism is this whole idea of, oh, we little men. And uh, the temple that uh, Sherry, Sherry, you did a fabulous job of showing us all of those pictures. But it just shows the contrast of what little that temple is as compared to the Parthenon. And by getting all these little people together that have really no significance on their own, there is the whole idea of together we can bring down the men and women who can think for themselves. And so um, to he, in his speech, uh, he's talking about um, these young men being crusaders. And these are all just mere words. There's just fluff. Uh, and he goes on to say, um, Thus, my friends, what the architectural profession lacks is an understanding of its own social importance. And you would think that when he's talking about social importance, he is thinking like Louis Sullivan talks about it in kindergarten chats that architects have a social responsibility to build a society. Um, and yet that's not what Dewey is saying. Dewey is saying, you're not hired lackeys of the rich. You are crusaders in the cause of underprivileged and unsheltered. Not by what we shall be judged, but by those who, those who we serve. Let us stand united in the spirit. Let us in all matters be faithful to this new, broader, higher perspective. Let us organize. Well, my friends, shall I say a nobler dream? And so these are just words to um, get people uh, on, on the team that, yes, we can't do something on our own, but we can do something together. And I just feel it's like um, emperor's new clothes, so to say, uh, where you have then people like uh, Keeping who are, who are just taking uh, things from others and making, uh, making it their own. So you can see this in the contrast between the Enright House and the Lois Cook House. And the Enright House, when uh, Keating sees the Enright House in, um, in the newspaper, he knows distinctly that this is uh, a house by Howard Rock. The lines, there's a mathematical order holding a free fantastic growth, straight lines, clean angles, space slashed with a knife, yet in a harmony of formation as delicate as the work of a jeweler, an incredible variety of shapes, each separate unit, unrepeated, but leading inevitably to the next one and to the whole, so that the future inhabitants were to have not a square cage cut out of square pile of cages, but a single house held to the other houses like a single crystal to the side of a rock. And you can see how beautiful just the image is, right? Um, but then you have the, uh, you have Miss Cook and she says, and kidding, I want the house to be ugly, magnificently ugly. I want it to be the ugliest house in New York. The ugliest Miss Cook, Sweetheart, the beautiful is so commonplace. Okay, so now when I hired our um, music teacher, I was looking for somebody who would be able to bring about the love for music. And um, I was interviewing some candidates and we, I said, you know, our music program is based in Western classical music. And, um, one particular candidate 
said, well, there's more than Western classical to music. And I, I said, but you know, when you listen to whether Indian classical or Western, those are the two that I'm at least familiar with. I can't say I'm very knowledgeable, but what it does to my emotions when I listen to music or I watch classical dance or perform classical dance, I see the emotional uh, change in my own being while I'm immersed in that activity. And I don't see that happen to me when I listen to hip hop or rap that, you know, uh, sometimes I would listen with my son in the car. And uh, he said, well, there's, there, there are, uh, you know, um, some good musicians even today. And I said, like, who? And he couldn't name a single person. And he couldn't, he said, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure they exist. And I said, where are they? So when Ayn Rand talks about the folk songs and um, music, and then she talks about, you know, the Enright House and Lois Cook House, you can see the noble versus the ordinary and what it does to the human spirit. Uh, so that was something I um, thought she had done very well. And then, of course, you know, you have the relationship between Keating and Catherine. Uh, to me, that, uh, I mean, when, when Keating designed the house as she wished it, I just thought he had sold his soul. That's the first line that came to my mind. And then you see that uh, when Catherine and Peter are together, for once, actually, Peter tells to he the truth that he is in love with Catherine. Um, that's like the one sincere statement he makes. And then he goes on outside with her and just betrays his own statement. And he starts doubting just because two, he had planted the seeds of doubt in his mind, right? And two is doing this to his own niece, whose happiness he should be uh, invested in. And, and then you went to he and, uh, Keating are talking about Dominique and Keating says well I was uh, she Dominique says he was in love with me once and he says that that's the wrong tense and I thought what a liar what a liar <laughs> you know he just cannot be true to himself and when um, Keating and Catherine and Tuhi are together and Catherine for once is excited about her work she says, um, she says she likes her work. And when we are married, Katie will have to give that up. I don't approve of it, says Kite. And, but of course, said Tuhi, I don't approve of it either if Catherine doesn't like it. And there's a total disregard to what Catherine wants. And it's about these men in power. And again, the reason it's very, Personal, I feel, is because I see this happening. I saw this happening to my cousins and friends who were married off with an arranged marriage and the condition was, okay, well, you've done your engineering degree and you have got your pharmaceutical degree, uh, but guess what? You're going to stay home and cook and raise your children. And to me, I was like, okay, sixth grade, that's never going to happen to me. So, <laughs> um, it, you can see this just perpetuates in society if you allow it. And so to me, that was, um, that, that sentence also was very um, attention catching. Now, when we talk about Stephen Mallory, okay, so this is the same thing when I talk about Ayn Rand to people who've never, uh, who've not read Ayn Rand and they don't like her. And I say, okay, have you read Ayn Rand's books? And they say, no, I've never liked Mallory. You can put Ayn Rand over there instead of Mallory. This is exactly what I hear. A strange sort of person, too tense. I don't like people who are tense. I've never liked his work either. Did I haven't even met him, you know, never even saw him. Like there's absolutely no, context in saying why this person doesn't like Ayn Rand, but they will refer to some random uh, criticism of hers on the internet that they've read or things that they've heard, but never really 
on their own come to their own conclusions and they're just repeating what people are saying. And you see that in Keating's behavior when he meets Tui and starts talking about things that Tuhi actually wants him to talk about. So it's you, you see that in uh, society around you. So um, I just think that this part two, of course, each part is beautifully done, but part two really captures what's noble in the human spirit and what the ordinary can do to that aspiration if they are allowed to take power. Um, so that's uh, that. Now I will mention a little bit about the importance of work in Montessori since, um, since uh, Sherry mentioned it. So we have the student who is 16. She dropped out of school in India because she just thought she was not respected and her, nobody listened to her. And every time the teacher would point out to her and have her stand up and then mock her. Oh, she doesn't know the simple thing. And she just said to her dad, I'm quitting. I, I don't want to go to school and good for her. She knew that and good for her dad who said, all right, let's figure out something else. And they called me and uh, she started on our online program. And now she's doing a capstone project, a year long project on Renaissance art. And um, she, she's been working with us since August now. And uh, initially it was a struggle. She wouldn't be able to sit through the lectures. She wouldn't be able to read the books or uh, do the work that she needed. And we coached her. We have a teacher who works with her on organizing her work and just the power of the book. So the first one was Shakespeare stories that she, the Shakespeare plays that she read uh, and they enacted those. The next were, uh, they actually read Anthem together. And uh, that was very powerful. Uh, it made her think a lot. And um, another book, uh, and, and they've been reading poetry and then started with larger projects. So from going from small bits to be able to do a year long project. So uh, I asked her the other day, I said, uh, you know, when I met you in August, you told me that you were watching Netflix because you wanted to be an actor. And she said, yes, I was learning how to be an actor. And that's exactly what she had told me in August. And I said, what do you think now? And she said, no, I, I, I don't watch Netflix anymore. I'm actually reading and writing. She's created her own website, written her, starts, has started writing her own blog. She's won a photography and poetry competition. Uh, she started a community service project for our online platform, where she found that during the pandemic, uh, orphanages in India didn't have access to devices. And so she went to the orphanage, um, interviewed uh, the people, found that 10 children were sitting around one little mobile phone, learning the lessons from the teachers. They're getting the lesson, but there's no interaction because it's just so difficult to do with 10 children crowded around a little mobile phone. And so now she is leading uh, the community service project where they have started collecting mobile phones to donate to these orphanages and getting phones from people, communicating with them, telling them the purpose, and then actually doing the work. In the process, she is learning to be a leader. Uh, she is learning skills to take responsibility, to deliver. And I asked her um, the other day, we had our uh, parent-teacher conference, uh, children are included in them. And I said, how do you feel? And she said, I feel accomplished. I feel that um, I'm happier than before when I was doing nothing. And I said, well, what's causing that? And she said, it's the work. It's the work that's making me feel so happy. And she said, it's so strange because I'm not supposed to like work, but I'm actually enjoying it. And so I think the importance of doing things by yourself is so um, helpful for children to understand at a young age, because as they grow up, then they are not dependent on others. 
they have that work ethic developed at a young age. Uh, and in any Montessori school, you'll probably hear this when they transition from a Montessori school to a traditional school. At some point, that transition does occur. And uh, when we invite our alumni back, they often say, you know, I was very surprised that people don't like to work. And we just enjoy it. We just take research projects or group projects or independent projects, and we just know how to go after them. So um, there are so many benefits of uh, learning how to work independently uh, to a child's psyche and as they grow up into an adult. So thank you. Wow. Rupali, that was an amazing, amazing story. And, and being able to do that kind of across the, on the other side of the world using just the internet, and, uh, it's just, just incredible, incredible. Uh, I mean, uh, kudos to both kind of you guys, you know, you, your teachers, this girl and her parents, because I'm sure it's, it's a complete system, a full, full support at, at all levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Joya. So I'm really glad that I'm able to do the bookend here to Rob, because similar to Rob, I'm also on the team of ultimately Dominique just drives me nuts, <laughs> but I've spent some time really even delving into the character. And so I really wanted to do this exploration of, of Dominique today. And I wanted to start uh, by returning to in one of our previous sessions, I had brought up um, some insights from this series of interviews that Ayn Rand had given way back in the early 60s. And so in these interviews, she also talked a little bit about some of her inspiration for the character of Dominique and, and the scenes that we read today. So I wanted to start by sharing some of that with you. So uh, so, she, so this is uh, from this interview. So she's, she's saying, um, we're on our way to, to New York, you remember. I told you we were driving. This was in 1934. And our car broke down in Virginia. Well, shortly before it broke down, it was just on the morning of the same day, I got a sudden idea for the fountainhead. And in a way, it helped me bear that whole disaster of the, uh, of the, of the well, ah, wait, sorry, I just lost my place. Ah, sorry. The whole disaster of the ah, near... Oh, I should have kept this, sorry. Um, better, sorry, the whole disaster of your accident, having to leave the car there and the whole problem. I remember being in an extremely elated frame of mind because what was on my mind primarily was that I had just got a very important idea for this future book. And let me tell you what specifically gave me the idea. You see, this Virginia road was under construction and in parts of the country, convicts were working on the road. And I remember we drove past a very beautiful Southern mansion. Well, it was really beautiful. It was old, but not in ruins. And all I remember is the very beautiful texture of the dark red bricks. You know how they get when they're weathered and white columns, a beautiful color combination. And it had an air of an almost aristocratic castle that is ancient, but still well kept up and like an aristocratic mansion suggesting all the best glamour aspects of a, a Southern society and convicts working on the road. And all we did was just drove past it. That was the source of the rape scene and the quarry. It integrated into my mind as an individual incident. I didn't have the character of Dominique yet clearly in mind beyond the general type. I don't even know at present whether I already knew I don't remember, I don't think, just what the conflict between her and work would be. In other words, the character of the heroine was only vaguely suggested in my mind. But one thing I was certain of, that it necessarily would have to be a romance that started with antagonism. Since my assignment to myself was, this time I am writing my kind of novel, and the events would be what I consider might be and ought to be, particularly what ought to be. Therefore, if it were to be the ideal romance, it had to start with some kind of violent antagonism. And it's in seeing that mansion and the convicts that gave me the idea of what would be the most romantic encounter possible in my kind of style. And it's then I decided, not that he would be a convict, but that he would have to be in some position like a convict, 
And since he was an architect, the next thought would be something to do with a stone quarry, which would be a good equivalent. And she would have to be a very aristocratic woman or in effect, the feudal lady of the countryside. I mean, I transposed the abstraction in that form, but I got the whole sense of what this scene and their relationship would be. And so while we were being towed by a garage man in a broken down car and then having to arrange to sell it and all that, that I was attentive to it, certainly in focus, but only a very small part of the top of my mind. And my whole mind was on that romantic scene. Um, and then just, uh, she makes a point here that I just, she mentioned, she, she's telling uh, Barbara Brandon, um, who's writing the biography, that uh, she can use it, this, this description that she says, if you can describe it briefly. But I would want you to make clear is that I have no admiration or anything for the Southern kind of aristocracy, but it was only what this particular building suggested, that widest possible abstraction. To make it clear to the little, literal mind readers, you know, that would take it as concrete bound. Uh, so she's not talking about you know southern ladies and convicts in the literal sense, but just this this wider abstraction. So of course you know this this brings up you know perhaps an even bigger question. Uh, you know she she describes this as being you know her style and her kind of novel and her idea of romance is that it has to start with this violent antagonism and and why is that? And I think here we even you know get a sense of her own sense of life and her own preferences from her ideas of romanticism. This was something we even started to explore when we did our whole series about the Romantic Manifesto. And when she talks about what romanticism is, she emphasizes that it's all about the plot. And what makes a really good plot is precisely having this kind of conflict. And I even wanted to share um, something that she says about conflict specifically that comes out of uh, The Art of Fiction, which was a, a series of workshops that she did um, helping aspiring fiction writers to, to create good stories. And so here she's talking about um, plot and the importance of conflict. She says, the essence of plot structure is struggle, therefore conflict, therefore climax. A struggle implies two opposing forces in conflict, and it implies a climax. The climax is the central point of the story where the conflict is resolved. Conflict here means conflict with other men, or conflict within a man, but not conflict against nature or coincidence. For the purpose of dramatizing a man's struggle and choice, a conflict within his own mind, which is then expressed and resolved in action, is one of the best devices. By that means, you present clearly and in action the man's freedom, the fact that his decision is what resolves the conflict. And she says, a man's struggle against nature, by contrast, is an issue of free will only on his part, not on the part of nature. The blind forces of nature can be only what they are and do only what they do. A conflict against nature is therefore not a dramatic conflict. No choice or suspense is possible on the part of an animate adversary. In a fully volitional conflict, both adversaries must have free will. Two choices, two sets of values must be involved. And so here I think we're even seeing kind of what Dominique is doing for Ayn Rand here in the story, because Dominique is this conflict in two senses. On the one hand, she has this internal conflict. She has both this, uh, you know, love and admiration for Rourke and who he is and seeing him as the ideal. And then this is in, in conflict with her belief that, uh, you know, he can only just be destroyed and the world as rotten as it is. And it would have been part of, uh, you know, Ayn Rand's style and sense of life that her ideal hero wouldn't have an internal conflict. And so this is even you know, something similar between Dominique and Dagny that, that the women can kind of have their own kind of version of an internal conflict. And we see Dominique gets this rather extreme internal conflict. And then simultaneously, there's the conflict between the two of them, the conflict between Rourke and Dominique. And I do think, you know, it's, it's precisely this, this love that Ayn Rand has for romanticism, for the drama of the conflict that is giving us, you know, why Dominique is the way that she is and why this love affair is going to start out with this, she says, violent antagonism. Um, but then, so just a little bit more about um, Dominique. Oops, sorry, I'm uh, just gonna pull up what I had a little bit more here from uh, this this um, interview series. Sorry, just gotta go down to where she's talking a little bit more about uh, what she says when she's um, getting her ideas about 
Dominique here and who the character is. And then we're going to get into a little bit more of why for me and my own sense of life, uh, why, why I'm more on the team of Dominique drives me nuts. And, and, and it's interesting to me too, you know, one of the things that Ayn Rand has said about literature is that, uh, you know, so Sherry was pointing out that, uh, you know, in the story, you know, she was asking us to pay attention to the sense of life of the characters, which I think, you know, is wonderful advice as we're understanding what the book is all about. But of course, a work of art, reflects your own sense of life as you start to respond to it. And I think Dominique can just be one of those characters that, uh, you know, depending on how you respond to her, might reveal something interesting, perhaps about your sense of life. And I feel that was definitely what was happening for me here. But it gets a, a little bit more when, when Iran talks later in this interview about the character of Dominique and how she created this character. So Ayn Rand says uh, here, Dominique, I don't remember exactly by what steps I arrived at her, because again, I had a sort of stomach feeling. I had a sense of life idea about the type of woman I would want for the heroine. I remember thinking consciously, being stopped for a while, but not for long, about what would be the nature of her conflict with Rourke. And the problem, as you know, would be that I couldn't give her any moral conflict, but it has to be some kind of conflict of why she would not be on his side immediately. And it didn't take me too long to figure out that malevolent universe would be the one excusable problem. Remember I said that Dominique is in effect myself in a bad mood. What do I mean by that? I simply projected that if what I really believed the kind of sense of life I would get in moments of unusual disgust or depression, it would actually be moments, but I couldn't say I ever lived a whole day on Dominique's premise. But taking the abstraction of the worst of my indignation against mediocrity, against the unappreciation of geniuses, against the whole mob collective common man feeling, I would make an abstraction out of that sort of emotion and ask myself, what if I really believed that this is all there is in life? How would I feel if I really thought that values or heroes cannot win? In other words, what if journalistic reality were metaphysical? All I had to do was even ask the questions, the whole character of Dominique was ready made. That would be one source material. The other was Frank, who's her husband, in a strange way. In the same way as he would be the source for Johnny in Ideal which is a, a short story she wrote. Because I knew there, that here was someone stopped by enormous contempt for the world and indignation at the world, what I would later call he's on strike. And I thought that would be Dominique's premise, that it is a withdrawal, not out of bad motives or cowardice, but out of an almost unbearable kind of idealism, which does not know how to function in the journalistic reality as we see it around us. From the beginning, from the outlines, Dominique, in effect, the key to her was me in a bad mood or Frank if he were a woman. Not Frank literally, but that social aspect of Frank. And when I read this, it, it started to clarify to me, I think, why it is that Dominique drives me nuts personally. And one of the things I realized, so Iran describes her style of writing as romantic realism. And I realized that I absolutely love that style, the combination of both the romanticism, the excitement, the drama, the uplift, the grandeur combined with reality. But when I was starting to even read how she kind of came up with this character, thinking about herself in a bad mood or about Frank, you know, it, it became clear to me in my own sense of life that it's not clear to me that this character is at all realistic. Uh, so certainly Ayn Rand didn't base Dominique on any actual person, the historical or living that she knew. It, it was this, you know, projection based on herself in a bad mood, if that mood uh, were, were to last beyond just moments. And, you know, as Ayn Rand said, she didn't even experience for, for even a day. And for me personally, it's not even clear to me if that's even a possible psychological state? Uh, you know, would it even be possible to have that kind of cynicism and still even kind of maintain this tension that Dominique has to not just, you know, have it completely boil over into complete cynicism about the world such that a person would, would lose their idealism completely? Uh, and, and it made me realize that for me, like, I love that combination of romanticism and realism and the very fact that my sense of life says, you know, finds it hard to find the realism in this. 
it's like, you know, kind of as Rob was suggesting, like intellectually, I can appreciate how Dominique fulfills the romanticism of the story and how she's the perfect character for this plot line. She's the perfect antipode, the perfect antagonist to who work is. And so for the romanticism, she's quite perfect. But I guess for my own sense of life, I would personally appreciate a little bit more of what I would feel would be a little bit more of the realism. But I'm going to be even curious to hear how uh, people's own sense of life, you know, from everyone else in the group, uh, maybe how they experience Dominique and, and their sense of life. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joya. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do this experimental presentation. I'm going to build off the point that Joya made about conflict. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start the whiteboard. Let me see here. Okay, can you guys see the whiteboard? Okay. Uh, let me see here what's going on. Let me make sure I can see people here. Okay, there. All right. So folks, for those who have not read The Fountainhead, this is like mother of all spoilers, okay? This is going to go through all of The Fountainhead. Okay, so if you have not read Fountainhead, please, Cut down, cut out your volume, come back when this white screen disappears, okay? You can look at the white screen, you won't get anything from it uh, because you will not know what is going on, but do not listen to what, if you, if you want to protect yourself against spoilers, because this is like spoilers big time. All right, so the point I'm making is that the structure of the fountainhead is like Beethoven's fifth, uh, Beethoven's fifth symphony. It has four movements, okay? The first movement sets out a theme. Ba, 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 bam, I will do that. Okay, it's an it's a act of will. The second movement shows all kinds of trouble that you are, a, you're going to have to face for it. The third movement is an attempt, multiple attempts, to kind of break out of it and not quite succeeding. And the fourth is this triumphant rise to the end, okay? So those are the four movements. So I'm going to plot them. Let's say we start here. Let me see how it's looking, okay. So this is, I'm gonna put them as straight lines here. So it starts like this, this is the first movement. The second movement is down here. It's the lowest point. The third movement is up from there. And the fourth movement is up here, okay? Remember these points. So I'm gonna put this point here, this point here, this point here, and here for the fourth movement, I, it's is the finale that counts. So I'm putting those four points, okay? So here is Howard Rock standing on the rocks, laughing. That is the theme, okay? It's basically, and what is the name of the first chapter? It is Keating, okay, this is Keating. So it is Howard Rock versus Keating, first-hander versus second-hander, that is the theme, okay? The second movement is the lowest of the lowest point, the hardest thing. This is the quarry. This is where you're starting from the quarry, okay? That's the bottom of it, okay? This one is Gail Wynan standing, sitting in his penthouse at the top of the building, at the top of the world with a gun to his head. So he, he has the internal, the eye, but is has chosen to basically use that, you know, he, he, his relationship with the external is all wrong. And that is seen by the fact that he's at the top of the world, but he still doesn't care whether he kills himself or not. And this one is Rourke at the top of the building that he himself has created with Dominique rising up to meet with him. Okay. So those are the points. So this is the theme that starts out here. 
this is the lowest point. This is one solution, which, which is Wineland's solution. And this is rock fully, okay? Now, look at this second point that it is where it is going. Actually, what happens is that this one actually goes down like this. So from Howard Rock laughs and setting out the contrast between Howard Rock and Peter Keating right in the beginning, it leads to the point over here is Peter Keating celebrating. So this is the success of Peter Keating. Okay. This second part is the lowest point. This actually goes up like this. So here is Howard Rock at its at his worst. And this section ends with what does it end with? Howard Rock saying to Elsewhere to He, but I don't think about you. So this entire negative, this is the section to his section. So this is Howard Rock saying, no matter what you succeeded in doing, it doesn't count, it doesn't mean anything. So that is, that is this section. What does this section end up with? This section is like this. What is that? This ends with Wynan on his yacht, separated out from the world. Remember, he doesn't allow any communication with the world when he's at that yacht. With Dominique, saying to Dominique, I love you. So this is how it, uh, Wynan is a person who is a first-hander, was never meant to be a second-hander, but chose second-hander methods. And he's coming back to that, but it's too late for him. But he's at least now, instead of locking that core up in the gallery, now it is kind of showing itself. So it is that. Now the point here is where does this start from? So this is an up arrow like this. This point here is the boy on the bicycle in Monadnock Valley. There, Rourke has already achieved this valley. And people around him, like this boy, can see it and be inspired by it to create something of his own. So that's where the, the last movement starts, this triumphal movement, that now he is, he's created things outside. He's gotten a whole bunch of people uh, ready to uh, be inspired by it and move forward. And then it leads over here. So that is the structure of Fountainhead. It in, includes all characters, all the major characters here, as he, she has named it, if this is Keating. So this is basically Keating versus Rock, which is the theme. The worst character is Tuhi and what he can do and the limit of what he can do. That is over here. Okay, so this is, this is the theme. This is the worst part. This is a supposed solution of the I versus the other people and coming up with this. And this is a full integration of, so that's the structure. It's the same structure. You can hear it in, in Beethoven's fifth. So let me see if I can stop it over here and uh, continue whiteboard share and then I can stop share this. All right, so that's what I had. Now uh, it's time for everybody for comments about anything and questions. Go ahead, uh, Sherry has her well, hand up. I'm Go ahead. I really like that. That's That was amazingly good. It's so good, I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> Go for it. Go for and, it. And I, well, I said to Rob, why are the rest of us here? <laughs> <laughs> but there's one little quibble I have. Yes. I don't think that each of the sections, I don't think it's Keating versus Rourke, Tui versus Rourke, 
whining versus Rourke. I think it's Keating and Dominique, Tui and Dominique, whining and Dominique. And the end is because, because Dominique is the one character who changes dramatically from beginning to end. I think- This, this is the theory that Dominique is the, actually the hero of the, movie, of the novel. Yeah. No, the, yeah. the, theme, the theme is not that. The theme is basically yeah. first hand versus second hand. Yeah. Well, I know that. that is the theme. So that, that's it in the beginning. And then all of these are kind of various ways of facing, facing the same. That was brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Evanique followed by, oh no, wait a minute, Jyoti. Jyoti, Evanique, and Joe. Jyoti. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. Why did the panel choose this book? Okay. Uh, so that we, we'll keep questions. We, we'll take comments and questions. Okay. Questions. My comment, keep... Okay. My comment about Dominic. Mm -hmm. I think she was a very powerful character in the whole book. <laughs> Everybody knows that. And I, I found her as a very complicated person who was playing games. And so was Rourke. She, um, she impressed me as a person who might have had a fear of intimacy. Like she just wanted to keep herself out of the radar with everybody. And whatever her reasons were, whether she felt like she might be disappointed from what she would get or, but she had a game plan. And the game plan did not work per se. And she wrote, on the other hand, had a game plan too. They both had a liking for each other. But they both were going, you know, back and forth with each other and trying to study what will, you know, start, what will trigger each other. So they did find that. You know, Rogue found it, she found it. However, they were compelled to keep going on their own and wait for time, the right time to come. So I find uh, Dominique, Rourke was a visionary. He, he seemed like a visionary. He knew what his plan was, how did it want to um, um, re reveal itself and how did it want to pan out in the end when it came to his job, his work. He was very confident what he was doing was right. And he had, you know, eventually he did. He was very successful. So, but she, I don't think was so concerned about that. She just was waiting for the right time to come so that she could sort of bring him in. So that's how I found this is how it was going for me. So those are my two comments. Got it. Thank you. Uh, next up is Evanique followed by Joe. Evanique. Yeah, uh, just two comments. Uh, one, I'm still team Dominique. I think. I understand Dominique in the, in the power structure of the time that Anne Rand was writing and that Dominique had to be the way she had to be because I think women weren't given the power that they deserved back then. And I think Anne Rand recognized that. And I think that's the character of Dominique kind of taking the power in a sense, but doing it in a way that I don't want to say she wouldn't be off-putting because I think she kind of was, but she took it in the best way she could for that era at that time. So I, I think that's why Dominique doesn't drive me crazy, which I understand why Dominique does drive some people crazy. I totally get that, but I understand, I think, why Dominique had to be the way she is, um, you know, especially being that woman from privilege, right? So she doesn't even have to, like, she doesn't have to work. She doesn't have to do anything. And in the 1920s, you know, the question would be, why would she work? Why wouldn't she be happy just having babies and not having to do anything else? And Dominique was railing against that a little bit. So I, I get why Dominique drives people crazy. And yet I still like her. Uh, number two, how it work. I know a popular opinion again, here I am. Um, I finally realized why he annoys me and Joya said it not about, I don't think you were saying it about how it worked, but it, it's what struck me is that he's unbearably idealistic. 
And that's, I think, what annoys me about how it works. It's like, not only is he, because I, I was reading today and his interactions with like potential clients and like he basically wanted to tell clients what he wanted to do, which is fine. You know, if you want to do that, that's okay. I get it. He's being his own man, all that, blah, blah, blah. But I just can't see him as a hero. I just cannot see him as the hero of the story. I think he's unbearably idealistic. I think he's unrealistically idealistic. And I think that's what annoys me about Howard Work. And so I kind of got it today. And I know it's an unpopular opinion that, you know, but <laughs> that's what I think. I think um, with Keating and Katie, that's, I'm sorry, I said two points, but one more. Um, with Keating and Katie, I, I'm i trying to understand Katie. I think I do understand Katie in the sense that she sees Peter for what she is and she knows Peter's going to lie to him. And I keep thinking, like, why do I like Katie so much, right? And I think because I see Katie and certain family members of mine, like, there's certain people that accept I don't want, they accept less than what they deserve. And they accept the men that don't treat them the best in the best way possible, but they still love them. So I think I, I, I'm, I still have empathy for Katie and I, and I see Katie and it's a shame because she's a smart young woman. And I think if you, I think Katie is just one of those people I, and she's young. And, and that's the thing too. Like she is young. And I think a lot of us make those mistakes when we're young, you know, liking the wrong guy, liking the wrong girl, you know, we, we've all been there. So I, I think that's why I think I have like a little bit of love for Katie almost because she is smart and she, and she has an uncle that's kind of like, you know, especially smart women in the 1920s, you know, that, you know, it was just the era of that time. It wasn't done. So I think I like Katie and Dominique for the same reason. And that Katie keeps insisting on helping her uncle because that's the way she can show her intelligence. And I think Dominique has a different way of trying to exert power in her intelligence in a time and place where that wasn't done. So those are my thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. And always feel free to express any unpopular opinions and that goes for everybody. Okay. All, always, always welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Joe followed by Monique. Joe. Yeah. So I'm a little bit behind uh, on, on catching up this week on any kind of like recalling uh, the events. I, so I'm going off a of memory and, and a little bit of what the presentations talked about here. Um, uh, but the Temple of Nike Aptos or Aptras, I am saying it incorrectly. So, uh, but uh, I think that that's actually what 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 um, Sherry and Rob had pointed out is really important. Uh, and we'd actually just had a interesting discussion on Thursday about with the Bible, uh, where there was this the interaction of Christ and the Pharisees. And I know introducing religion and Ayn Rand is like not necessarily <laughs> that's kind of really stretching it, but there's something to something true there, um, where essentially you know Christ was calling out people saying you're not necessarily following on true, you're prideful, you're you're the Pharisees are you know prideful, they're in you know they're they're actually just espousing what they believe, but not what is true. And that not what is authentically true, more importantly. And so I really thought about that when, if with Peter Keating and his inability to say, I don't know, his pride that exists within him, that he has this, this, this lack of humility that exists, that is actually so important to have that Rourke does possess. If you think about it all the time, Rourke is willing to do, be a, a regular workman and, and, and go to work in construction sites 
versus Peter Keating always has to have the the best, ha you know, the the best office, the best job, and he's chasing something uh, that is. No, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you? I'm going to make you a co-host. Could you uh, handle the uh, be the moderator? I need to step away for a minute. Oh yeah, I could try. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so um, uh, no, but the idea that something is uh, false. And I and I in a sense in a sense that these are fake things that that essentially Peter Keating is chasing. So I found that that you know this untruth that we're kind of you know we were talking about on Thursday where Christ was calling out the Pharisees and saying, look, what you're hanging on to is the forms and the rituals, and you're not necessarily following through what the rituals are supposed to be completing or doing, is really an interesting parallel because. You could see it in Peter Keating doing the same thing. He's actually following what society in this conformist kind of belief system that is being pushed down on him by society. Whereas, again, you see this with Peter Keating, uh, with uh, Howard Rourke, his nonconformist approach to the world is actually really what, and his humility is what makes him Howard Rourke. So, that's a, you know, that was an, a very, I think that in the, in the inability, and I'm taking it back to the Temple of Nikkei Aptos. All right, all right if I'm saying that incorrectly, you know, I, I initially said Nike when I first read this in, <laughs> with my friends and all the way back in the day. So it does mean victory, by the way. But so anyway, um, but the, the, uh, the, the fascinating thing is it, it's a weakness that he's demonstrating that he doesn't say, I don't know. And, and that it, this humility that goes along with that. And I think that that's a really important point. And I thank you know, Sherry and Rob for actually really calling attention to that. That, that is, a, that is a, uh, um, something I had not thought of because I, I always thought of Peter Keating as just something weak, but, it, you know, but it's much deeper than just a weakness. It's a, it's a, you know, there's pride and, and there's a lot of other uh, unfortunate uh, types of characteristics that he has, uh, other than just uh, being, uh, uh, other than just uh, being weak. You know, being weak is just you know, something that's much more shallow. Um, the other point I think that's really important, and, and again, actually, and this is why these meetups are so great, uh, is that, you know, what Rapali had talked about with uh, Lois Cook and her, uh, um, uh, her basically wanting the ugliest, ugliest house. And that's really important as well, uh, because there's a huge distinction between, and I'd brought this up and then Rob had answered my question anyway, uh, in the, in the past, uh, and, and Joya had brought it up, uh, as well with, uh, when when Rourke was actually going for drinks with Mike and this idea that um, that essentially there's this there's this uh, a, it's it, Rourke is not just simply a rejectionist he's he's not simply just saying no to everything and not conforming uh, without some idea of what he actually believes in. Whereas Lois Cook is the exact opposite of that, where she does conform, I mean, or, or reject just everything. I, want, I, don't, I don't want a different house. I don't want something that could bring something new into the world or beautiful. I want the ugliest house. I don't want to write to your standards. I don't want to, you know, I, I, my writing is going to do what it, you know, is going to be what it is. I think that these, that is a really important point because a lot of times when people uh, think about whether, you know, what, work what work is really standing for is he just being um you know uh does he have his own problems with pride and it's and it's not it's it's the difference between having values a set of values and principles and not having a set of values and principles and willing to stick by them and and not willing and and whereas you're just if you're just kind of basically rejecting everything that uh, that had previously existed it's almost an ignorance that exists where you're denigrating everything without actually understanding the purpose of why things exist in the first place. Uh, so I think that that's also a very important point when it comes to these types, uh, you know, um, 
uh, to this to, to this discussion. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not keeping up with the group this week. Uh, so with the reread, but it's but I, I thought that these were fantastic points. I had something else, but I actually kind of uh, got distracted, which isn't shocking. Um, but uh, the the uh, guess I guess the question uh, that I had is is I guess Design Rand see herself in Dominique at all. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, that would be a question for people that understand Ayn Rand better than I. Uh, so that would be my question. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all I had. So I don't know actually if there's any more comments. Joe, so, can you repeat your question, please? Well, essentially, does Ayn Rand see herself in Dominique? Uh, I don't know. I, I can say something on that question. I don't. I don't know okay. how you're moderating this, uh, Joe. I'll go right ahead. Actually, well, I, I should <laughs> probably. Well, I should go in order, but I'm going to be really selfish and actually just put it out there first. So, so um, I'm not going to. Yeah, that'll be my question. Yeah, go ahead. Please say it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll just uh, say a little bit more about that. So. Um, I had said that uh, in, in my little presentation how Ayn Rand kind of described uh, Dominique as herself in a bad mood, but there are even some examples she, she talks about where she kind of has these Dominique moments, and there's one I remember she talked about when she was a child, and she had this one favorite story called The Mysterious Valley, which was even the story that ultimately inspired her to become a writer, and it was it, there was a, a hero named Cyrus that inspired all of her future heroes, but she tells this really interesting story of how, so that particular story, it came in the form of a magazine from France. And part of even how she got it was her mother, they were in Russia, but her mother wanted her to learn French. And so she subscribed to this kind of exotic French magazine. And at one point, and so it was this story that like nobody else in Ayn Rand's class really had access to. But then she found out that one of her fellow classmates was also getting the same magazine. And she describes how she had this kind of Dominique-like reaction because the student was someone that, like in her opinion, just didn't deserve it. It was someone that she just thought was completely opposite to her values and someone who wouldn't have appreciated the story at all. And she describes how she kind of had this Dominique reaction of how she just didn't even want this person to have that, that magazine because she, she didn't deserve it. So, so I think that there are definitely ways in which, um, you know, in, in her phrase, you know, Dominique is, is myself in a bad mood. And, and I'm, I'm sure that some of those, um, you know, reactions are, are from uh, Ayn Rand's own experience. Can I say something as well? I'm Monique. I don't know. Yes. And forgive me for actually, I, I, oh. I just, yeah, forgive me for not calling you. I didn't see your hand no, that's actually fine. waving. That's fine because so, I like what Joya said. Um, yeah. One thing that uh, Ayn Rand said, I, I don't know if it's at, at the beginning of the book or she said, if you don't believe that men like Rourke exist, I can tell you that they do because I married one. So is she Dominique? It's irrelevant. She's the creator of all these amazing characters. And they're, they, uh, we say uh, all wet in French, which means um, uh, they're strikingly so. They're, they're a little bit of all of us, right? We all want to be like Howard Rourke and live happily, no matter what's going on, whether you don't have any money, whether you have to work in a quarry, the guy is okay. He says at one point, he can only suffer to a point, and that stops there. Uh, but, you know, I don't think the quarry is, um, is okay, it, it's a down point for him because he's lost everything and he has no money. He has to go work on the quarry, but I don't think it bothers him that much. But in that in that situation, I always I I wanted to say something about the colors um, that Cherry said. It was so brilliant in that you know she can tell us in her book and Rand that who's rich, who's not, who's but she does it with color. If you notice the way you said, Sherry, that, you know, the quarry and, and all these dark colors. And, and then you get to the color of the sea. And that's where wealth is, right? It's these muted colors. 
and also her great beauty. So here's Dominique, the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. She's almost inhuman in her looks. I can see her this big, you know, and, and tall and she doesn't have to be on a diet. And she dresses this way because she's rich. And remember her apartment, it's all glass and it's, it's wealth. And so when you compare the two, it's a beautiful way to express wealth and, and being poor. And I also, you know, Peter Keating from the onset has no backbone, no, no sense of what's important in life. He just wants to sell his soul to the highest bidder so that he can be rich and successful. And so he's so pathetic. Katie is, is the love of his life when he's with her, he's happy, but he can't have this and be because he sold his soul to Chewy. And so, you know, he's going to end up in, in, in dirt and God knows what, because as it's the absolute opposite of Howard Rourke. And so I, I think that's the saddest part, I think, of Katie and Peter is they were meant to be, they loved each other, but he sold his soul. So he doesn't have anything to give her. And so as, as a whole, it's so beautiful, right? Every character is the absolute, either good or evil or whatever. And that's what I like about. And how do, how do we not like Dominique? She fell madly in love with the soul of Howard Work. And I think it was they recognized each other on that level. And I think she wanted to be possessed by him and hope maybe that she wouldn't have to deal with her feelings because remember, she never wanted to be disappointed. That's why she didn't care about anything. And she didn't, you know, she, she just lived on a surface in her own little universe. And she was nuts to a certain point. Remember that she didn't want him, her love, the love of her life, to succeed because she didn't want ordinary people to live in his buildings. I mean, that's to me, you know, that's crazy. She couldn't handle the fact that somebody might throw garbage somewhere on the floor or whatever. So she would rather he would be poor and if he didn't have to go through all this mess. So what do you think about that? I mean, it's so obvious to me that that's why she did that. She, he was like a god to her. Does anybody on the panel want to comment on that question? Or thoughts, any thoughts? Well, I will say this, that one of the, that we all agreed last week, or uh, maybe two weeks ago, I forget, um, that yes, one of the most sad and tragic parts of this book uh, is Peter's inability yeah. to be with Kate. I mean, it's just yeah. tragic. Uh, and it shows you, once you have this lack of values and internal, like kind of, just ability to to follow your heart that essentially it, it will ruin you and as we'll see uh you know ruin you in every which way in every part of your life so it's it, it really is tragic um and so yeah I, I thought that that was one of the key of the books and that's what Rapali and actually Sherry had brought up last week so uh I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh Jyoti could you repeat your question for the for the uh, panel please why did the panel choose this particular book? Oh. What was the idea? What were you looking for, the panel? Yes. Do you, do you mean, um, oh, why sorry. did we choose why to select? select? Yeah, why did you select this particular book? Yes, for the meetups. For the meetups, not as in, in general. Right, right. Why here, for this particular uh, meetup, why, okay. why Fountainhead was chosen when there are so many books? What was there the are, idea? It came up after, as we were finishing up um, the autobiography of an idea uh, uh -huh. by Louis Sullivan, that we were thinking, wow, we should tie in the fountainhead and, and watch some of the um, backdrop yeah. of the, the similar and, and architectural were, history happening. I found also that not just architecturally, but in terms of 
you know, the, the basic ideas, the basic approach to life. There were a lot of themes coming out of Sullivan that were clearly influential on Ayn Rand and, and, and were common themes that went to Ayn Rand. So that was sort of what prompted, to, prompted us to do this. Okay. At least that my, I know that was the original origin. I, I'll share a little from, from my perspective. Oh, sorry, from, from my perspective, I mean, I, I even saw it sort of as, as the evolution of these meetups. So these meetups started, my understanding was it even started because of Maritza, who's not here, but she was the one who would propose to Srikant initially doing a whole series on the Romantic Manifesto. And that's when he got myself involved and Robin Sherry and Rupali got involved. And I remember when we started with the Romantic Manifesto, we started with one session all about the Fountainhead, just as a way to concretize what art meant to Ayn Rand. And I'll say personally, I found that media very frustrating in that I felt there was so much that we could talk about the fountainhead and having to try to cram it all into just one discussion. And then so after having done that and then having gone through all of the Romantic Manifesto and our whole exploration of Louis Sullivan, to me, it just felt like, well, now we've just got to talk about the fountainhead in some real detail. And, and Joya, now I feel like this exact same way when we have 10 weeks to talk about the fountainhead. It's like, <laughs> it's got to cram how much into one week? It's too much. <laughs> I'll just add really quickly to this. You know, I know that, I mean, the architecture transition is really interesting. I mean, you know, essentially the, the correlation with obviously it's a, it's a natural follow on to Louis Sullivan. Um, so I, I think that that's was, uh, you know, one of the reasons, but I know Maritza as well. She had actually led uh, some discussions at the Thinking Society uh, prior to this on Ayn Rand. Um, and and uh, our group did generally, you know, didn't necessarily uh, go over Ayn Rand <laughs> that often. So um, so she brought that to, she, it was really something that she was always passionate about. And I think everybody uh, that follows Ayn Rand really reads either Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead first. I, I mean, it, the fount usually that's their, their two favorite books. So um, it, was, it just made sense, I think. Uh, so Rapali, you also had something to say. I remember you mentioned that it was a very popular book in India as well. Yeah, I think um, when after, I think we were towards the last chapter of uh, Autobiography of an Idea, and I texted Sherry to say, are we doing Fountainhead next? And I think it was on all of our minds to do Fountainhead next as a natural um, sequel to what we were discussing from the Romantic Manifesto into Louis Sullivan's Kindergarten Chats and the Autobiography of an Idea. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Evanique's point about uh, Rourke being too idealistic and too, um, you know, unrealistic or um, unreasonably re unrealistic in his approach. And that's something that I hear quite often about Rourke or um, Ayn Rand's characters that they are not practical. And uh, I have just come to find more and more people who are like that and who can really live their life truthfully because they are value driven and they are driven by their own uh, work and own values and not by uh, what is accepted by society. You, you can see these characters you know, around you and thank goodness that these characters really exist, that our world is so much better because uh, imagine living in a world of second-handers, that would be horrible. Thank you, Rapali. Um, are there... Uh, any other comments? I Can I make one comment? Oh, sorry. I sure, think, uh, um, yeah. Iris, 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 would you like to make a comment and then Jody, please? There you go. <clears throat> okay. Um, I <clears throat> have a kind of timeline for the book mm -hmm. um, with the uh, <clears throat> with the money we hear is worth today. So Rourke was born in 1900, which makes it easy to keep track of how old he is. He's 22, class of 22 is where uh, uh, Keating graduates. So he's 22 years old when he's thrown out of college. Uh, he's hired by Cameron at $15 a week. That's $242 of our money now. 
He says that he has $17.30 in his pocket, which, you know, if you don't convert it, it sounds like, oh, you know, he can buy a couple of meals. But in fact, it's $256. So, you know, he could probably rent, rent a, a room, a shared room or something. Uh, in 1925, uh, uh, Peter hires um, Rourke for $65, which is about $1,000 now. That's, uh, you know, uh, Cameron collapsed, which is why he needed the job. And Tuley's book comes out that year. By uh, 1928, uh, Rourke is in the quarry. Uh, when uh, he's given a dollar by uh, Dominique, uh, keep the change, you know, part of that is uh, what he, for the time he spent there, that's $16.30 now. I. Uh, <clears throat> Keating got Cortland Holmes, 1937, so Rourke is 37. Uh, the apartments were built for people earning $40 a week. That's $774 now. Uh, the book covers 15 years plus the time to build the tallest building in the world. Uh, it was another 18 months after he got the commission. Uh, the Empire State Building was built in 15 months, <clears throat> and we don't have, I don't have the time that it took to design it, but, uh, you know, it's probably somewhat similar. Okay, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Joe, for filling in. This is wonderful that I can just hand it over to you whenever I, whenever I need to. Just, just great. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jyoti. Yeah, I was going to respond to uh, Rupali's um, uh, statement about Rourke type of people. I know quite a few actually very close people who were Rourke uh, character. <laughs> Not quite so, but very much the goals and the aims. My own personal feeling is people who come from deprivation, they have high ideals. And by golly, they live every day to, for those ideals. They want to achieve um, by hook or by crook. And they see what they are going to, what they have, they are visionaries. They see already and other people can't see this. So they call them fools. They call them stupids. They give them a name, but they carry on. And I think that is one element that's common with all those people. Early deprivation. That's it. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, Sherry and Rob. There you go. Now you can talk. <laughs> I had a couple of things in response to some stuff, interesting stuff that uh, that Joe brought up earlier. Um, where he talked about, well, first of all, I'll talk about bringing religion in and talking about Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand would not have found that strange at all because she thought she saw herself as dealing in the same area as religion. And you'll notice that even in this book later on, though, she says, in the, I think in the introduction to the 25th anniversary edition, that this is something she probably would have changed because you know people take the wrong take interpret it the wrong way. But in Rourke's speech, very end, end of the novel, he talks about the highest religious abstraction, and the, her relation to and the, the issue of religion is actually going to come up in the very next section we're doing with Hopton Stoddard. Uh, so just look for that. I think it's in the sixth chapter actually. Or no, it's at the I think it's the end of the tenth chapter here. So in the next section of stuff we're going to be doing. We're going to be getting to Hopton Sodern and the, he brings up, sort of acting as Tui's mouthpiece, he brings up this issue of religion. Uh, and so I'm just going to point that out, that that's coming up as sort of an answer on what Ayn Rand thought of religion. But I, the thought that I thought was really interesting is you talk about the humility and the pride. Mm -hmm. And one of the points I was making about with her with regard to selfishness or, uh, early on, we are, where, where Keating, Keating says he's selfish and then Rourke says, what he's done is the most selfish thing. So she's sort of oftentimes turning these concepts upside down. And I think what she would say is that Keating's problem isn't too much pride. It isn't pride. It's actually insufficient pride. It's insufficient self-esteem because his, his self-esteem is so fragile that he can't admit error. 
you know, that, that um, you know, if he thinks that there's something he doesn't know, if he doesn't know what the temple of Nike Apteros is, he thinks, oh my God, if I don't know that, that must mean I'm worthless, right? He doesn't have the self-confidence to say, I don't know what that is, uh, you know, and maybe I should go look that up. So uh, I think that was something she said that I, I, I um, Joya may know where this is, but I think the something she said was that, that she got from, uh, from her husband, Frank O'Connor, that he basically had so much self-esteem that he could, you know, he, he had unafraid to admit when he was wrong or we didn't know something that any setback like that didn't fundamentally hit his self-esteem because he, uh, he, he didn't have this insecurity that if I don't know something, there must be something wrong with me. He was so serene in his self-confidence that he could admit error uh, and admit to not knowing everything. So I think that's sort of she's sort of inverting the commonplace conceptions of what humility or or pride or self esteem uh, would mean. Uh, so you know, Rourke is, Rourke is so has so much self esteem that he doesn't mind admitting if he doesn't know something or if he's made a mistake, because you know his his self esteem is not precarious enough that being wrong and or 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 being falling short in a particular instance would damage it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's sort of one of the things that she's trying to get across with those characters. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to point out that actually this exact issue we dealt with yesterday in the Gita meetup, because what it right. is, it is oh. making a distinction between our two kinds of self, which are actually different from each other. The self that Howard Rourke is talking about is an authentic self. It is actually in the terminology that I have used, it's kind of he's standing in the center. He is looking at existence itself and is reacting to existence and doing what he thinks he should be doing based on that. So that is equivalent of being kind of true to your own Atma. That's what that's how it puts it. The, yesterday Gita said, look. You are either friend to yourself. That means you are acting in accordance with your principle of your own self, or you are an enemy of yourself because you identify yourself with something external, how other people view you. What do you have physically? How, where are you in success in life? That is yourself. If you think that is yourself, and that's exactly the self that Peter Keating is talking about. And the concept of pride versus humility, it is be because these two concepts of self, the same word is being used for these two things, which are exactly opposite of each other. So actually that is the theme of Fountainhead. It is the theme of center versus periphery. Peter Keating is all periphery. It's all reflection of what is around him. That is all that he has. He has no, when Howard Rocks asks him, where is your eye? He falls apart because he suddenly realizes that he has no center. He has no eye. So, and that eye is the core of religion as we've been seeing in the Bible meetups, in the Gita meetups, in the Tao meetups. So in that sense, Ayn Rand is very much, Howard Rock and Ayn Rand are very much spiritual. They are primarily, you know, they're, they're, it's all about integration of spirit with matter. Um, so that, that's what I would say. Uh, next up is uh, Rupali followed by Joe. Rupali. So uh, I was actually just going to talk about yesterday's uh, meetup on the Gita and um, Monique's uh, observations about Roark and how he was joyful in any situation that he was in, right? So whether he was uh, designing or in the quarry, his core remained really strong and at ease. And so uh, yesterday we talked about this idea called sthita pradnya, which is your, you keep your center stable and steady and the waves that come or everything else is like the ocean and waves are coming at you. And this was something Shrikant, you spoke about very eloquently last night. 
uh, is that you don't let those waves affect you. And Rourke is like that steady uh, human being. And uh, why does, we, we also talked about why Krishna selects Arjun uh, amongst all the five brothers to be his friend and to, uh, to be with him in the war. And that's because Arjun is that character who is open, who is questioning, who is also stable and can stay the path. So I think in that manner, uh, Rourke is the, the character who knows the center and is true to the center. I was just going to say the same thing, Srikanth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rupali. Uh, Joe. Um, that's okay. Um, it was, it was, it was actually, you just made me re think about something with the, the, the Gita and now my mind's going in that direction, but something Rob had said about pride. I, I it was, it was something where redefining pride is you really interesting. Uh, but Beautiful. anyway, thank you. Yeah, it was verse five and six, I think was really yes, exactly to the idea. That's what it all is exactly all about. That. And, and it, it's amazing. Like, uh, I don't know who it was. It was Penny who made the observation that Gita is very modern in that sense. It is actually describing this exact phenomena in, the, in those verses that you, if you identify yourself with how other people view you or what your physical you know, kind of success is, then you're going to be away from, from your core. You're going to be not friend to your, yourself, but you're going to be an enemy of yourself. Um, thank you. Um, all right, so folks, any closing remarks? Um, I'm going to let the panelists go first and then anybody else who wants to make very quick closing remarks. Rupali? So I'm looking forward to the next week because then we're going to see Tuhi and Roark uh, together. And so that is going to be very interesting. Wonderful. So it will be about five chapters. I'll, I'll figure out, I'll, I'll have to see to see where the exact cutoff is. But it's been, you know, because the structure that Ayn Rand has of her novels is so beautiful, there are very clear breaking points. It's very easy to see. Um, okay, anybody else wants to make any closing thoughts? Rob and Sherry, do you have any closing thoughts? Nope, okay. Uh, Joya, I don't see you on the screen. Okay. Only that we're very much looking forward to next week. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, yes, folks, me too. This was, uh, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm glad I got to talk about my uh, Beethoven's Fifth because I like, I don't know which one I like more, Beethoven's Fifth or Fountainhead. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's come like, like we were talking about Gita yesterday. Like when you're, when you love something, you know, all, all your senses get into it. So uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Hey, everybody. Great job. Just a second. I, I'll tell you, I, th there is an amazing meetup tomorrow by Yasuhiko Kimura about integration of East and the West uh, and, and spirituality in the modern world. Um, so it, don't miss that. It's at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, 11, 11 a.m. Eastern. Bye, everybody. Hey, Sherry Khan, quick question. Yeah. You said that's a monthly series? It's going to be a monthly series? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. He's going to, you know, he, he used to come every month. He took a break and now he's back. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Bye. Bye.